in and out of juvenile hall, shoplifting and everything. Those are traumatic years. See, the dark cloud comes over me when I talk about it, so it's not to talk about it for too long, but he has one conversation with uh, Ansel Keys on the phone when Ansel was in his 90s, and he gets the idea that Ansel was the worst scientist he'd ever met. So right now she's getting a million dollars in funding a year, and her salary is around 150,000. So where's the other 850,000 going? And well, I did a little research on that too, and it's going to the same lobbying PR firm that the Koch brothers use. The beef industry are some of the best marketers in the world, and so is the dairy industry. They know what makes people tick, and with men, it's masculinity, and with women, it's beauty. Steve was so emotional back then, which made him great. You know, it was once again his greatest weakness and his greatest strength. You could see quickly what we all knew that he was the dumbest person any of us had ever met, and the smartest person all rolled up into one. He could see things no one else could see, but he couldn't see the obvious. And I somehow I got assigned to debate him all the time <laughs> on the things that he just couldn't see. Welcome back to another episode of The Proof. I'm Simon Hill, your show host. Today's guest is Chris McCaskill. Chris is an earth scientist with one heck of a career and journey that's seen him spend time in the fossil fuel industry, time in Silicon Valley with Steve Jobs, and time with a team of exceptionally bright and enthusiastic folks at General Magic working to create the world's first smartphone. Time setting up and scaling his own companies, including Fat Brain, an online non-fiction bookstore that ended up listing on the NASDAQ and then being sold to Barnes & Noble. And now, Time spent making exceptionally well-researched videos on food under his new alias and YouTube channel, Plant Chompers, a channel that I highly recommend everyone checks out and subscribes to. The work he's doing is truly second to none, a huge inspiration to me, that's for sure. Chris flew down to Los Angeles to meet me for this episode, and of course, being the historian that he is, he brought two full suitcases full of classic nutrition books and magazines. I've never met anyone who's as dedicated as Chris to going back through nonfiction books. If you want to see a few of these books and magazines that we spoke about during the episode, I recommend watching this on YouTube. Before we get into this episode, a quick reminder to please subscribe on YouTube, Apple, Spotify, or whatever platform you're tuning in from. Your support is truly greatly appreciated and enormously important to this show finding its way into the ears of more people. And now, my conversation with Chris McCaskill, aka Plant Chompers. You didn't think about rocking half a beard today? Half a beard? Yeah. Half a beard? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, like it, people it gave me the strangest looks at that TEDx talk when I arrived. It's like, what is wrong with that guy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I knew that you go by the the name Plant Chompers yeah. on, online, but then in doing some research, uh, I saw that you also go by Baldy. Baldy, yeah. <laughs> my son's. And that's because. I shaved my head bald when I got to forty because it was starting to turn to moss. Right. And. Um, and I had to give a big talk at a booksellers association. There were 2,000 people in the meeting, and I had just shaved it. I bicked it. There was nothing on the sides. And when I got up there, people in my company were shocked, and they nicknamed me Baldy, and it stuck from then on. Yeah, I thought it was funny when you, in your uh, TED talk on the on deforestation yeah. and food, and you were explaining the half beard, yeah. half being the the rainforest yeah. that, or the forest that are still with us today and the other half being uh, what we've cleared. And then you had a laugh about, did someone someone mention that you're doing the, the desert thing yeah. pretty well? And I took my hat <laughs> off and showed the top of my head. And uh, someone made that crack in the elevator because they were asking me, what is this beard thing in the elevator at MIT, other TEDx speakers? And I said, oh, this is to show what the earth used to look like with all these forests and we've deforested almost half the earth so i've shaved it down a little bit and she said well you could also show desertification because <laughs> i know you're bald <laughs> and i thought i'm gonna open with that so, so a couple of years ago i got an email from you yeah do you remember sending that i do yeah very clearly and i opened that up and uh i think you you said you were 
grateful for the work that I had done yeah. and and that you'd created a video. I'm not sure which video of yours it was. It may have been the influencers one or perhaps it was before that. It was one of your early videos. Yeah. And you thought that I might be interested in, in yeah. watching it. And I watched it and immediately I was captivated. Oh, good. I thought something different about this guy. Oh, good. He's a great storyteller. And I think what I appreciated most and it was something I was kind of reflecting on in, in just reading about you and, and thinking about what you're doing today is you seem to really emphasize quality over quantity. Mm. Is that important to you? Yeah, it seems yeah. like you take you have a very deliberate, very uh, thought out, methodical, um, I don't want to use the word slow, but it is slow relative to, say, TikTok and the yeah. content that's being created m moment by moment. Yeah, everything I had read about how to get started on YouTube was you got to be regular and publish every week at least. And in the early days <clears throat> with Casey Neistat and so on, it was every day. Um, but I just didn't like to do that. Uh, it isn't that I didn't want to do the work. It's that I wanted to produce better quality episodes. I just I just like the quality aspect. I don't know if I'm obsessive compulsive or what it is. And so with some of these episodes, my channel would just die waiting for me to publish this episode in the beginning. Like when I did the, the Influencers 1 version 1, I got a lot of comments, well, you forgot this person, that person, and so on. So I did a much more extensive one with 60 more influencers. That took me 30 days. I worked on it for 30 days. I didn't do anything else uh, but work on that. And I thought, well, <laughs> I do not you know, fit the YouTube algorithm because 30 days is too long to wait. But then it took off, and I thought, well, it's got 170,000 views, so, you know, Maybe I think people appreciate the level of research. I mean, you've brought some some historical magazines yeah. and, and books with us today. Yeah, <laughs> all kinds. And if you read them in person, I know a lot of your listeners are, you know, on podcasts, but if anybody can see that in the, mm -hmm. you know, we've seen that cover many times, but to actually read the article and see how positive they were about this guy and not just that article, but. Here's another one on Ansel Keys's profound contributions to World War II. Both the starvation experiments, were which were just stellar, unbelievable experiments, and the K rations. And he had already done high altitude testing and things. He, he was, you know, I, I don't think many fields get a scientist that great. And, you know, the beef industry, food industry has done everything they can to discredit him. But... Do you think he's the most important modern-day no nutrition doubt. scientist? I think he's the most talented, the most important. I think the seven-country study. You know, when I, I was a graduate student at Stanford, I was in geophysics. And I didn't like the fact that 25% of our time I was in the electrical engineering department and 25% in the geophysics department and 25% in the mathematics department. And I only got to do geophysics 25% of the time. And the geophysics stuff was advanced, you know, digital cameras on satellites, really exciting stuff. And in those other three departments, everything we were studying was from the 1800s. And there were these landmark studies, Maxwell's equations for electrical engineering. We spent a year, three quarters, on just Maxwell's equations and really getting them in our bones. Um, and he's probably the most profound contributor to where we are with electronics today of any scientist who ever lived. And, you know, I, I greatly admired them for what they did, but I wanted to get on the cutting edge. Well, you know, I think it's the same with Ansel Keys. I think the seven country study is just one of these amazing studies you could never do again because you just don't have the environment to do what he did. And they didn't really know how to design studies like that. He invented that. Well, he and Henry Blackburn and some of the others, um, a whole team of international scientists, they invented how to do that. They didn't just depend on questionnaires. They assayed the food sent it back to the lab, froze it for future. They, it was just unbelievable what they did. Mm, yeah, I think it gets lost, the, the sophistication at the time of what they were doing. Yeah, and you know, the thing is, what really gets me, my heroes are scientists, and Ansel Keys was a great scientist. When I was talking to some others, um, they would say, why wasn't he, why didn't he get all these accolades, you know, Nobel Prize sort of, or, you know, multiple accolades? And um, and I don't know. I guess it's the food companies trying to discredit him, the beef industry and so on. And they've done a good job at that. But if you look at any of the claims 
like the one you and I saw on Twitter yesterday, he's responsible for more deaths than Adolf Hitler because he promoted a low-fat diet. He didn't promote a low-fat diet. The seven country study is right here. It's the Mediterranean diet. Who's read that? It's still available. It's still in print from Harvard University Press. The, the books, some of his best-selling books are right here. It's the Mediterranean diet, full of olive oil and fish and cheese. And, you know, it wasn't low fat. It's much harder to, to take the time to get those books and do the reading than it is to fire out a quick tweet, though. Yeah. And, but I got obsessed with him because I thought he was so good. And so I became friends with members of the team, like Henry Blackburn. He's like a really good Is friend. Is he 96 or something? 97, yeah. yeah. 97. He's doing great. He's out on a ski boat and everything. <laughs> wow. You've met him? So I haven't met him. You know, I asked if I could come out and, and interview him in person on the camera. He's not the most articulate guy. I mean, I love him and he's probably going to watch this episode. <laughs> and, I hope so. And fact check. He's me iconic. And, He's iconic, yeah. I mean, he wrote, he ran the Seven Country Study a lot longer than Ansel Keys did, and you know, Ansel Keys retired seventeen years into the study. It's a fifty-year study, and then Henry ran it for the rest of the time, including after Ansel's death. And a lot of the most profound um, papers published about it came after Ansel Keys died. So, the fact that they isolated Ansel Keys and tried to discredit him when you know, Nina could have talked, Nina Teicholz could have talked to like Henry Blackburn, but. I think that there's this almost oversimplification that Ansel Keys said to eat low fat. And then what resulted was the consumption of snack well cookies, you know, low yeah. fat, high sugar yeah. style products. But even though that happened to a degree, that's not what his message was. It wasn't his message. He wasn't on the committee that he wasn't part of the low fat craze of the 80s or anything like that. It was saturated fat. His hypothesis going in was fat and half of it got proved wrong. You know, it just didn't turn out to be, you know, all fat. It turned out to be just saturated fat, a profound finding. And some people still deny it. But I've heard you say, I heard you say on the Rich Roll podcast, that is one of the foundational messages of nutrition. If that falls, a lot of things fall. But... <laughs> It ain't gonna fall because the evidence for it is so strong. Yeah, and it's only it's only got stronger since yeah. Ansel Keys yeah. started working on this. Yeah. Um, where does your love for nonfiction and digging into the archives come from? You know, that's a really good <laughs> question. Uh, so, in a, I've never mentioned this, but we're my oldest son is good friends with Jeff Bezos, and so we've gotten together several times and. Our photography businesses run on Amazon's cloud, and so we're very close. And it's we're one of their biggest customers, so uh, we're very close to them. Smug Mug, so Smug Mug's one of them, and Flickr's another one. So um, they're for higher end photographers, serious photographers. Anyway, um, uh, walking with Jeff one day, we were camped out somewhere, and my son Don and Jeff would play cards in the evening. Uh, we were talking about some of my irrational passions and Jeff said, well, I've got them too. You don't choose your passions, your passions choose you. And I thought that was interesting. I've always been interested in historical nonfiction. I don't know why, biographies and so on. But when I was in Silicon Valley, we used to always talk that programmers, software engineers, they like sci-fi, science fiction, and scientists like nonfiction. So maybe that's what happened to me. I'm still trying to wrap my head around your journey. <laughs> yeah. It seems strange me for me having having come across you through the Plant Chompers channel yeah. and knowing you for that. Yeah. And then <laughs> <laughs> like, the, the, the research that I've been doing, it has been blowing my mind and I'm trying to piece <laughs> this together, how an earth scientist ends up in Silicon Valley working yeah. with Steve Jobs, meeting Jeff Bezos, um, being part of these incredibly successful startups. Yeah. Maybe we should do it chronologically and step back. I know that you grew up in Oakland and, yeah. and spent some time on the street. I think people might find that hard to, to believe when they hear everything that yeah. you've done. In and out of juvenile hall, shoplifting and everything. Those are traumatic years. See, the dark cloud comes over me when I talk about it, so it's going to talk about it for too long. But, you know, I, I like to think of myself as a well-adjusted, happy adult. And when I go back to that, it's like, you know, I ended up taking a wrong turn 
um, and ended up in Oakland one time and thought, I'm back in my old neighborhood and I started to sweat. And I thought, what, is this what PTSD is like for veterans? You know, my heart was racing and it's like, I'm 50 years past that. How could this be? But so I had a pretty good upbringing until I was seven with my grandparents. They loaded me on a TWA jet from Pittsburgh and I ended up in Oakland with my mentally ill mom who had a master's degree in biochemistry from Cornell and dreamed her number one dream for me is go to a great university and get a master's degree. Impossible because she thought the communists were going to get us. It, it's a long story. Um, so she withdrew me from school after second grade and we couldn't pay the rent, you know, for our apartment. So we ended up on the street, third, fourth, and most of fifth grade. Um, and I shoplifted and we had out garbage cans and, and, um, you know, there were these angels in the form of Catholic priests and nuns who would feed us soup kitchen kind of stuff now and then, and they wouldn't judge us. We were filthy and you couldn't have any self-respect doing that. And, um, and there were lots of drama, like the, the judge in juvenile court that I had to go to several times would demand that I identify myself and I wouldn't do it because my mom told me if they ever catch you playing hooky, they will put you in San Quentin for life. Playing and hooky. I believed it. I knew she was mentally ill and she said things that were crazy. What's hooky? Hooky was uh, if you don't go to school when you're supposed to. There was su supposedly a truant officer who would catch little kids who didn't go to school. <laughs> Probably a myth scared the daylights out of me. But there is a California law, and I think that's why my mom was in California, where you cannot detain the mentally ill for longer than 72 hours if they do not present a threat to society. So my mom would get drunk. She would create a scene. She would yell and scream and everything. And someone would call the police. The police would come get her while I'm hiding. And they would take her and recognize it as a mental illness. And she'd go to the mental ward of some hospital. And I'm alone, you know, and supposed to be in third or fourth grade on the streets of Oakland. Thank goodness there were wonderful homeless people, half of them mentally ill or more. Um, and they just watched after me until my mom came back. So is that is that normal? Is that what normally happens? Or is, does child services kind of normally step in? Child services normally steps in. I was just so terrified about San Quentin that I hid so nobody could find me. So... And then to, to give you an example of how I hid, uh, when I finally got in juvenile hall and I couldn't get out, um, somehow I got out, I don't know how, and my father got custody of me. I didn't know him much. He was a big, strong guy, heavyweight boxer in the Navy, golden gloves, and captain of his hockey team at Queens and everything, deep voice, um, scary guy, and, uh, and quite a disciplinarian. He would take the belt on me and things like that. And I wasn't going to tell him that I missed all those years of school. So I tried to start sixth grade and I could not understand what those kids were doing. They were doing times tables. They were doing diagram the sentence, prepositional phrases and all that. Couldn't understand it. So one time when Mrs. Givens called me to the front of the class to diagram a sentence, I just drew a box around it and the kids started laughing and it was just so humiliating and you can't have any self-esteem when you've been homeless all that time. And I had an East Oakland black accent because all my friends were black. I didn't, there was only one white kid I knew. He was Japanese and everybody made fun of him because he was Japanese. And um, so I had this, I was a white kid with a black accent in an upper middle class neighborhood, Orinda, which my father lived in. And so I just ran out of the classroom and hid in a drainage culvert for the whole rest of the day. And then I looked at those hills separating Arinda from Oakland and thought, you know, I can just run over those hills. No one will ever catch me. I'll disappear. I know how to survive on the streets of Oakland. I'll never be caught. And for some reason, I don't know why, I decided just to tap on the door to my home and see if my dad was going to be furious and take the belt on me and all that, whether the principal had called and told him I was playing hooky. And it was my stepmother, my fourth mother, who answered the door. She'd never had children. She was a New York stage actress. Um, and she just hugged me. You know, she just got down on her knees and just hugged me while I sobbed. And I, so I stayed. That's what you needed. Yeah. So I stayed. She knew something had happened, but she didn't know what and why I would go hide in the culvert all day. Thank goodness she, you know, didn't beat me or something. So somehow. I, I knew I could outrun you. the dead pulled it together because you end up at Stanford yeah, doing that was a miracle <laughs> and become an earth scientist. So 
so I guess what takes place from grade six to Stanford? Yeah, well, so one of the things is my mom uh, said she memorized the complete works of Shakespeare. I don't know who can do that, but she seemed to have done it. And she would re she would belt out Shakespeare as we'd walk along on the sidewalk. Hamlet, you know, is this the knife before me? Come, let me clutch the... <laughs> gives me shivers to think about it. And it was so embarrassing, I would be a block behind my mom while she's screaming all these recited verses of Shakespeare. And, um, and so I just didn't want any memories of Shakespeare in my life. And so first of all, in the sixth grade, I got put in all the slow learning classes, remedial learning. My IQ was less than 100. They tested by, I had to cut up pieces of paper and see how they unfolded, I had no idea. And in junior high, I barely passed, just barely. And I finally got into high school and I had to take English and they would keep bringing out Shakespeare, Romeo and Juliet or something like that. And I would find a way not to be in class or something. So I got D's in English, but I got A's in everything else because there was a teacher who had his face nearly burned off. It was a scar tissue and everything. And the kids made fun of him of uh, chemical engineering. And he was really good and a smart guy. And he could see that something was wrong with me and he took me under his wing. And we just bonded. And so he coached me on calculus and everything else. And, and I placed it at the, as a sophomore, I placed it in the very top of the county for calculus. Anyway, my story's going too long. But w I eventually got accepted to UC Santa Barbara down here. And I took Fortran and all the science and everything and I got A's but I got an F in English because they wanted to teach Shakespeare and I just couldn't. Um, so they let me repeat it and I got an F again. And they let me repeat it one more time taking correspondence from UC Berkeley and it, they said, it's pass, no pass and everybody passes. And I got a no pass because I just couldn't. I How couldn't. old are you at that stage? I was 19, I think, as a freshman in college. And um, so- Had you given up hope at that stage of going to college? I was angry. And when I walked off that UC campus, I said, I am never going back to college again as long as I live. It's just not going to happen. I'm so upset because, because I can't understand. I can't do Shakespeare and I can't tell anybody why. Because I still had this notion that it was humiliating and maybe it, there would be consequences. I don't know. <laughs> was that because it, it brought back the memories of your mother? Was that? Well, it's just humiliating to be homeless, shoplifting on the street, eating out of garbage cans. Uh, filthy, you know, it's just with a mentally ill mom who was drunk, you know, a lot of the time. And schizophrenics end up with substance abuse and everything which she had in spades. So I, <clears throat> I drove an old pickup truck to a summer camp in Southern Utah and where I was supposed to be a summer counselor for a kayaking program. I like to whitewater kayak and I was kayaking in the surf a lot at UC Santa Barbara. And, um, and when I walked into that that lunchroom at age 19, there was a girl at the end of the table with this wonderful voice. I never saw her that night, but she just had this wonderful voice and I could just feel myself, oh, I'm falling in love with this voice. Who is this person? And the next morning when I saw her, it was just, oh, she had this red bandana on and I just, and this smile just melted my soul. So I started asking about her and it turns out she had graduated from college, Phi Kappa Phi. She was two years older than me. Phi Kappa Phi, I didn't know what that was, but it sounded fancy. And, <laughs> and I was never going back to college. Not going to happen. And so I thought, well, as soon as she finds out who I am, you know, so I can't, I can't, you know, I got to shake off all my feelings for her. And I tried. And I was training for the Olympic team in kayaking. And I had built myself up to 195 pounds. And I think I could have made the team. The coach said I would have made the whitewater kayaking team. And I fell so hard in love with her, I lost 20 pounds that summer because I just lost my appetite. I, all I could think about was Tony. And, um, and at the end of the summer, I finally had to tell her some of my story. I wasn't willing to tell her all. It's the first person I'd ever told that to. And thank goodness she had a degree in psychology. And so she understood and she listened and she took pity on me or sympathy and empathy. And uh, I had to go take care of my parents' home uh, to make ends meet while they were off somewhere. So I invited her along and we both got jobs at Sears and in Oakland. And she worked in cosmetics and I worked uh, in the warehouse as a scab for the 
Teamsters Union, driving a forklift and all that. And I just, all I could think about was her. So eventually she decided to leave me because she thought I would never propose or anything like that. I didn't know that was what was on her mind. And I just kind of squeaked out, well, I thought maybe someday we'd get married. I was 19. And she said, I would marry you at the drop of a hat. And, uh, and that started our love story. That's, we just celebrated our 49th wedding anniversary. And she her, convinced, she her convinced cameo, me. Uh, sort of appearances, sorry to cut you off. Her, her, yeah. her cameo appearances in your videos are some of my favorite moments. I adore her, as <laughs> you can tell. And, and so she convinced me to go back to college. You can't be dating. Your best girl can't be a college graduate and you being a flop out. I mean, your male ego can't. Mine couldn't handle that. So she said she would tutor me through English and she would find classes that, where they didn't have Shakespeare. So we found technical writing classes that I could go to. And I did okay in those, but not great. And then in my sophomore year, some professor of higher education from USC gave a talk. They had this power lecture series every month. And I went to every one of them, sat on the front row. This guy, Paul Dunn, said <laughs> it, the title of the talk was Learning is Delightful. And he said, the biggest fraud that has ever been perpetrated on the American public is the IQ test. It measures interest and exposure, and that's it. And my whole body lit up because I was the retard. That was my nickname before Baldy because I had a low IQ and I couldn't pass my remedial classes and all that. And um, so that really lit it up. And he said, if you want to graduate in the top 2% of your class, I promise you, you can do it. And here's how you do it. And I was thinking, yeah, well, you don't know who I am. Um, then it's probably ain't going to work on me. And uh, he said, I want you to go to the same place, same station every day, six days a week, four hours. Don't eat there. Don't get distracted there. It's the same cubbyhole, whatever it is. And, you know, just study and you'll learn to focus for those four hours. And that's all you need to do. And you'll get in the top 2% of your class. And that's what I did. And I got in the top 0.1% of my class, and I even got an A minus in English, and they gave me a full scholarship to Stanford. That that was geophysics. That's geophysics, it. yeah. Right. Yeah, I think that that task of sitting for four hours and studying <laughs> has yeah. probably only become harder and harder yeah. with all of the technology yeah. that's around. You got to put your phone on Do Not mm. Disturb and forget about the comments that people are saying on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> um, just when back to that moment where you kind of opened up to Tony, yeah, and told her about your past, that's that's a pretty scary thing to do. Oh, I was wetting my pants because I didn't. It was on a beach on a river, and and I didn't. I just thought when she heard that, that was it, and I would just go off and sob somewhere. You know, she's a college graduate, and when I don't have a penny to my name, you know, I got a borrowed pickup truck. It's all. I think we're all kind of scared of that of of those parts of us that the people around us aren't aware of and the fear of of judgment yeah and but it must have felt afterwards it must have felt like a, a weight off your shoulders a little bit not not really it took me years to get used to it because i was so embarrassed it was just humiliating and now she knew my some of my dirty secrets i wasn't going to reveal them all in fact um, there's a dozen stories I've never told, not my kids, not my wife, nobody. And I just can't, you know, there's one story I did tell my oldest son and I just started sobbing as I told him. And, and I just thought, you know, I can't, I can't take myself to that darker place again. I just can't. So I think that, you know, they say the best comedians are, they've had some trouble in their past and they've used comedy to cheer them up. And, and, you know, I, I probably do the same thing. So I'm not the greatest comedian, but I, you know, try to have fun to clear up a dark past. This episode is proudly brought to you by Inside Tracker. Track your blood biomarkers, understand your biological age, and receive personalized lifestyle tips backed by evidence to optimize your health. To get started with Inside Tracker today and get 20% off your first purchase, head to insidetracker.com forward slash Simon. That's insidetracker.com forward slash Simon for 20% off. So you graduate and now you're an earth scientist. Earth scientist, yeah. So you go and work for a decade or so. Yeah. Core, core labs. 
Yeah. So what happened was I went to work for a company called Western Geophysical. I, I, I should say one thing first. When I got to Stanford, I had um, the greatest earth scientist as advisor there has ever been, Alan Cox. He came up with continental drift, paleomagnetism. He was the equivalent of Ansel Keys, but for geophysics and uh, honored everywhere, fellow in the National Academy of Sciences, the whole thing. And the first day I met him, he said, you did really well on your college entrance exam, except for English. Why so bad in English? And I thought he was going to change his mind on accepting me and giving me a scholarship. And I couldn't believe, how did I get so lucky to have him as an advisor? And um, so I was about to wet my pants again. And he said, you're here to get your master's degree. You have to write a master's thesis. And in order to become a great scientist, which is what you're here to become, you must first become a great writer. And I'm not going to pass you unless you become a great writer and you've got two years to do it. And I had my two-year-old son on my shoulders. He must have seen I was starting to break down in tears. So he let me go and I walked out in the quad and for an hour I sobbed, thinking I'll never graduate now. Learning to write, you know, like learning to enjoy canned asparagus. That was my, my um, analogy at the time. And then I just had to get over myself. And I applied Paul Dunn's principle to it. I'm just going to study an hour or two a day at the same place every time. And I picked people as far away from Shakespeare as I could. That was Winston Churchill, Mark Twain, and Abraham Lincoln. And he saw my progress. So he invited me to speak uh, at one of the biggest donors Stanford ever had um, and um, be the concluding speaker. And I decided to tell my story on the streets. And I was so nervous, <laughs> I couldn't have Tony in the room. I had to have her sit out in the hall because if I saw somebody, I just thought I would die. And I couldn't make eye contact with Alan Cox because I knew he didn't know the story. And four minutes, five minutes into my 10 minute speech, when the room just went so silent, you could hear a pin drop. I thought I've really blown it here. I've just, this is terrible and I'm embarrassing the university. So I changed the subject and went into geophysics and didn't complete my story. And then I went out dejected and told Tony, let's go. I bombed. And, um, and somebody chased me down, the CEO of Western Geophysical, which was a billion dollar geophysical company, the envy of the industry. He chased me down and said, uh, where are you going to go to work? And I said, Chevron. And he said, well, they will teach you to be head of a department. We'll teach you to be CEO of the company. What? What, what are you saying? And so he personally mentored me because of that talk what for two years. What did he see in you, do you think? Was it the, the human side that you showed, the vulnerability? I asked him that. I asked him that, and he said, when you were an undergraduate at University of Utah, you worked 3 a.m. to 8 a.m. at United Parcel Service every day in order to pay your way through college, and so you could have a baby, Don, and your wife wouldn't have to work. And who else does that? And you graduated without any student debt at all. Um, that impressed me more than anything else. Right. It's in a your background. sign of character and determination. Mm -hmm. So, so that must have given you a bit of confidence. And then you step out yeah. into the into the real world and start working. Yeah. So I'm two years at Western Geophysical, and we're mainly doing field work. It's geophysical work where you're sending sound waves down to the earth and listening to the structures that come back. You're running a crew of thirty to sixty people, and so on. And we were all over everywhere, inside the Arctic Circle and Canada, Wyoming, Montana, Florida, Georgia, Mississippi, Alabama, and the swamps of Louisiana, southern Texas. Uh, we worked everywhere. And uh, with really good, hardworking, soul of America kind of people. And in Texas, we ate a diet of armadillo and snakes, rattlesnakes that we caught, in addition to the vegetables that we could grow and get at the store and so on, um, they're cold blooded. So they're, they have a much better fat profile than, than <laughs> what tropical beast. Um, so, um, um, and now it's all fast food down there. The food companies won, sorry to bump the mic. And, um, and then I got a letter from one of my professors, the other one with a huge reputation, uh, at Stanford, he was the department chairman. And he wrote and said, I want to start a company. I'd like you to be president. Are you interested? And it was just a short little letter. I still have it framed on the wall. And he became my best friend in life. And we started this company called PSI. We raised a million dollars in venture capital and got shot out of the cannon. And Western Geophysical came and bought it for $10 million 
uh, two years later. <laughs> and, but it was a laboratory company. He was a laboratory scientist and we were doing testing of fluids. And so <clears throat> the CEO of Western Geophysical had bought core laboratories off the New York Stock Exchange. We had 53 testing labs and 34 of them were water and doing EPA tests for water. So we're testing for silver halide and you know where photographic companies were and semiconductor companies were and all kinds of toxins around the chicken farms in the Chesapeake Bay drainage area, for example, foster farms, that that manure was coming out of there so concentrated, no one knew what to do with it because it would burn the plants. So it would seep into the water table and into the streams and cause all the lobster, the bottom dwelling things, the lobsters, oysters and everything to die at the bottom of Chesapeake Bay. So you were starting to kind of connect all of those dots. I was connecting those dots. And the, the just seeing those chicken farms, you just can't believe. Is this the early 80s? Early 80s. Right. 1984. You seeing those chicken farms, it was just a life-changing experience. And talking to the chicken farmers and things, you just, you, you can't imagine. If it was bad then, I mean, what's it been 40 years since? It's just gotten exponentially worse. And so the fishermen in Boston tried to sue Foster Farms, but the, the company with the biggest balance sheet wins. And so the fishing industry lost and the chicken farms won. And, um, and that was pretty life-changing because the conditions and the pig farms, what do you do with all that pig manure? You, you spray it on the crops in poor black communities and they get sick. And that gets you into epidemiology. Um, so long before Mendelian randomization, we were randomizing among environmental variables um, and doing epidemiology. <laughs> so that that was a shock to come into nutrition science and think you can't infer causation from epidemiology. Who, who ever thought that? I mean, there are professors, there are books written all over the place about how to infer causality from ep epidemiology. Did the food companies invent this so they can ignore Ansel Keys or, you know, what about the, smoke, the epic smoking studies that Richard Dahl did concurrent to Ansel Keys' study? He was a giant too, and Richard Pito. And, you know, Walter Willett with his saturated fat studies in, and asbestos, strokes and high blood pressure. I mean, there's all kinds of epidemiology where you can infer causation with very high confidence, especially if you, you know, also have randomized control trials to look at markers and things. So that, you know, in... In earth science, what happens is you get some company dumping some kind of chemicals in the river or the, or the groundwater table, and the epidemiologists see this cluster of kids dying of cancer and adults getting sick, and it's bad. It's just tragic. And so you try to, you partner with the EPA to show the rest of government agencies, there needs to be some enforcement here. We need to clean this up and we need to stop them from dumping. And it just is the most obvious thing. If you're in out there in the field seeing that, the lead leaching from mines in Colorado. So you, Core Labs was like- They did a lot of were that. Were measuring water, levels of- Water testing. Right. Yeah. So, um, so anyway, when you're, in, it's kind of life changing when you're in that. So inevitably the victims try to get reparations from the company and justice and they try to sue and the companies can hire expensive Harvard lawyers. There's a great movie about this starring John Travolta, a civil action. And you can see how depressing it is because I think it was Robert De Niro who played the, the expensive Harvard lawyer, <clears throat> excuse me, they do everything they can to cast down on epidemiology and they quote nutrition scientists. And it's like, what? Um, you know, no, we can't do any randomized control trials on children and expose them to these chemicals or asbestos in the ceiling. Or, you know, in earth science, how can you do randomized control trials? You wanna have a control Yosemite to see if glaciers over millions of years will create a U-shaped valley? No, you can't do that. And so, um, <clears throat> so that was life-changing. And then <clears throat> the other thing that was life-changing was watching this parade of great scientists, Carl Sagan, James Hansen is Ansel Keys, Alan Cox level. Um, and I'm skipping ahead of <laughs> here, but James Hansen testifying to Congress over and over and over during the 80s with Al Gore listening on and, and inviting him back. Uh, Carl Sagan in 1985, James Hansen culminating in a great testimony to Congress in 1988 about 
carbon dioxide, he had figured out what made Venus so hot, you know, it was, and why the oceans boiled off there, got unimaginably hot because of the greenhouse effect, CO2. It's just high school chemistry and high school arithmetic. And we thought now politicians will know, consumers will know, no sweat. And what happened is the Koch brothers and Exxon and Rupert Murdoch, thank you, Australia, um, came along and just destroyed James Hansen's, you know, reputation among the public, not among scientists. They were very- What did the public in the mid to late 80s think about climate change? How was that conversation, I guess, different to today? Uh, the difference was we were focused on how fragile the atmosphere was. We didn't call it climate change. That's an invention of Frank Luntz. He wrote the book, Words Matter. Um, and it's not what you say, it's what people hear. It's a great book. So he renamed, for example, the estate tax to the death tax. And that changed the public's perception of that tax completely. People really wanted to ta tax rich people when it was called estate tax, but they did not want to be taxed themselves. And calling it the death tax changed politics forever. So the words really mattered. So he, he made the term climate change popular because it was much less, um, we called it global warming. And but the but, but the biggest concern from the very day I started geophysics was how fragile the atmosphere is. It's a very thin layer, and our planet is a miracle. You can't find another one, and no one's found anything like it in the universe. And partly it, because the atmosphere boiled off or something, and so they lost the ice caps, the moisture, the water, and everything else. And we had that scare with with you know the hole in the ozone and so on. So that's what we were thinking about. We were thinking about that and global warming. We weren't focused on other greenhouse gases, mainly carbon dioxide. And there's a saying among Earth scientists that we pretty much knew most of what you needed to know about um, climate change in the 70s and 80s. We haven't learned that much more since. It's just now the public is finally starting to say, well, maybe we should have listened to the scientists. Maybe every horror movie really does start with ignoring a scientist because now we're getting floods and tornadoes and everything else. Yeah, you sent me a photo of a, a cover of a book, The Decade We Almost Stopped Climate Change, yeah, great Losing book. Earth. Yeah, Losing Earth is the title, yeah. It's a great book. Um, it's written by a New York Times uh, reporter, um, investigative reporter. He did a great job on it. And um, the New York Times had done a, um, a team of, of um, I can't remember the author, but the the team of um, of reporters uh, had done a New York Times Magazine piece, and it was very popular on it. So he decided to do a book on it, and that book was published, I think, about four years ago. And it's an editor's pick everywhere, a awarded book. Um, and he, I thought I knew that story pretty well, but listening, reading that book, half of it I didn't know because he had access to internal documents from various meetings. And even the earth scientists involved in those meetings didn't remember what they said in those, with those internal documents. Uh, but basically it was one guy, um, there were just a few influential people in the White House who convinced George H.W. Bush, who won the election based on um, doing something about climate change, the greenhouse effect. He famously said, those who worry about the greenhouse effect uh, underestimate the White House effect, what we can do to fix this. And um, the chief of staff had an MI, a PhD from MIT in mechanical engineering, and he fancied himself as a client science. Don't ask me how that happens. How a guy like that? And so we blocked everything. We blocked the Kyoto Treaty. We blocked it all. And we lost the ability. And then that gave the Koch brothers and Exxon and everyone else right. fuel. To what were the, the kind of strategies or tactics that the fossil fuel industry and the food industry was same. using. They're the same, same, same as playbook. Yeah. And so, uh, I laugh about that or I cry. I don't know. Um, they would start these front groups and for some reason they name them coalition, you know, the, the climate change coalition, the CO2 coalition that's still going. Well, they sound very authoritative. They then. do. <laughs> right. So the moment I came into nutrition and I saw, uh, the nutrition coalition, I thought, Ding, 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 ding. Is that a front group? Mm. Um, is that Nina Teicholz's? That's Nina Teicholz's group. And so I started looking for public disclosure because it's a nonprofit. And I saw their finances. And I looked at her messages and who's on the board. 
and they're supposed to be dedicated to nutrition research. They don't do any nutrition research, zero. They do lobbying and they do marketing. And Nina is really, really good at, at in connection with the Cattlemen's Association. And so right now she's getting a million dollars in funding a year and her salary is around 150,000. So where's the other 850,000 going? And well, I did a little research on that too. And it's going to the same lobbying PR firm that the Koch brothers use, a lot of it. And so that's why she's in the East Wing of the White House. And she's, and their messages are, you know, I have a book, viewers who can look at. Uh, so building the beef industry. Be, building the beef industry over 100 years, this starting in 1898. And they, they've got the whole playbook in here. Presidents and cattlemen. You can't do that. You and I are sitting here in Santa Monica in a studio. We're not visiting with the president. And they figured out that a great PR strategy was uh, the public relations dream. Um, uh, uh, Joanne, as she was known, she just became such a hit on the public relations trail because she was a mother. She was smart, articulate, someone you really wanted to like. And they have followed that model many other times, including, I think, with Nina Teicholz, same thing. It's the same playbook over and over again. And when the playbook doesn't include some really tough problems to solve, such as what do you do in Japan if they're Buddhists and they don't eat you know, meat off the hoof and they haven't for millennia? Well, you come up with a special book, Marketing Beef in Japan. And you start with the youth because they, they don't, they're not as entrenched. It's just like Nestle trying to get coffee, which is, is more innocuous, accepted. And they've succeeded. The food companies, they win. Do you think it's gotten to the point now where it can't really be swept under the carpet and ignored due to the, the nature of the conversation? You know, I think we're getting there with, with global warming um, because... You can't ignore what's happening to the earth. And I see that it's in the conversation everywhere. And with obesity, people have got to know this is, for, I think the latest numbers are 43% obesity rate in America. Right, 75% are obese or overweight. Yeah. I'm just doing a, uh, an episode on uh, Japan's school lunch program. The numbers I keep seeing for Japan is 4% obesity and 37% overweight. That's a difference. And guess what they're doing in those schools? They're teaching these kids to love vegetables. They teach them where they come from. It's all whole food. They have a nutritionist at each school who designs the menus in collaboration with all the other nutritionists. They have chefs who prepare it. The kids serve it. They attend lectures on vegetables. They go to farms and see how they're raised. They learn to appreciate it. I, I feel like when I read a, a, a book like Stefan Guillenet's book, The Hungry Brain, um, and you did a really great episode. Just had him on, yeah. Yeah. Super um, smart guy. Yeah, he's a, he's a smart guy. When I read a book like that, I can't help, I guess because of my background, thinking I can summarize this book pretty much in two words, food companies. And what's the solution? I think I can pretty much summarize that in two words too, neural adaptation. The food companies you know, have given us Doritos and Snickers and everything else, so fruit doesn't taste sweet anymore. But those kids in Japan, they're being, they're, they have neural adaptation to love their vegetables and their rice and a modest amount of, they rotate through pork and beef and chicken and tofu uh, on alternate days. And, um, and they learn that from birth. And then there's restaurants around Japan that just school, recreate the school lunches because people have great memories of it. They love that food. You need, you need some sort of strong political will a brave yeah. government to, because as you say, I mean, the problem is simple. It is simple. But the solution is very complicated. I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> well, Stefan said in his book, uh, eat simple food. It's the best way to solve your brain's craving for all these rich foods. Just eat simple food. You'll lose more weight that way. And I think as we've seen you know, populations all over the world that eat simple food, they don't have our obesity rate. No, but it's it's much easier when you're living in an environment where that is the norm. Yeah, yeah. Rather than having to resist. 
Yeah. You know, the indulgent, seductive foods. Sometimes I think of it like a sports game. And you know how when the the score gets, it's a blowout and the score's getting run up and you're getting discouraged and uh, you're starting to hang your head low because you're getting blown out on an important game. And then the other team is just running up the score. You know, it's like, isn't this what's happening with the food companies and the public They're, and nutrition people like you and I? They're just running up the score. You know, 43% obesity today, by 2030, it's going to be 50%. That's <laughs> like, this is a blowout. You know? Right. There's a point, though, where that surely becomes far too expensive from a healthcare point of view, you loss of think. productivity, and we have an aging society globally. You would think. Um, so it, it may it may end up being a financial <laughs> decision for governments. Yeah, well, the incentives are there for the other advanced countries because they have public health care, and so it's an expense for them. So they have all the incentive, you know, but even they in Canada, Germany, Australia, they all say, well, our health care system is getting pretty busy. <laughs> There's a lot of people coming in because obesity is rising there too. So you're... You're at this stage. You're working with Core Labs. You're starting to notice some of these, yeah. connecting some dots between various things, um, various industries like the poultry industry and what's happening to the environment. Um, at what point do you begin to look at your diet and behaviors and, and the things that you're eating? Well, that that started early actually, um, because I used to caddy for Jack Lalanne as a young teen, and. Uh, he was my hero. I mean, he was larger than life. Hollywood star, famous TV show. I mean, and it was always in a foursome and the other three people were all famous. Um, and he was the nicest guy, just the nicest guy you could imagine. But he would lecture me on nutrition <laughs> because that's who Jack was. And so at the 11th hole, yeah, I would caddy for him and one other guy who, who was um, uh, Rick Barry, who was a star on the Warriors and became the NBA's uh, most valuable players. They won the national championship and all that. He was six seven. Jack was five six. Jack was muscular. Rick was skinny. And uh, I don't know how many times I caddied for him, but a lot of times. And Rick would never talk to me, but Jack would. And when we get to the eleventh hole, there's the cat. The the golfers are supposed to buy their caddies the treat of their choice. And of course, the treat of our choice was a Baby Ruth bar, a Butterfinger bar, a Reese's peanut butter cups, or something like that. It's a Baby Ruth bar. Oh, it's a it's a chocolate nougat nuts oh it's so good <laughs> and they were five cents but they were these big long wonderful bars and i had a sweet tooth um, and they were easy to shoplift when i was on the street so um you know so i had neural adaptation plus 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 for baby ruth bars um any very famous candy in america so anyway jack would say raisins or peanuts that's all he would get me and raisins were disgusting in that age so i got the peanuts <laughs> I always got the peanuts. And the other caddies didn't want a caddy for Jack because they wanted the treats at the 11th hole because back then, you know, parents didn't allow, didn't indulge their kids that much. It was a different cultural time. So you didn't get much candy. You got a little bit. But um, And he would say things. I mean, he had it dialed in, in the 60s. He had this dialed. He would say, Chris, if it comes from a cow or a pig, don't eat it. Where and, was he getting that from? I don't know. Um, well, his mom was Seventh Day Adventist. Okay. Adventist. So, uh, and I'm assuming Ansel Keys was out with his popular books. And some of the scientific advisors to Jack at the time were at Loma Linda University, and other places too. But but um, a lot of his friends were were Adventists. And um, so um, he would eat poultry. He would eat egg whites. He would eat fish. But he would say, "I want you to eat ten vegetables and five fruits every day." It's like what? And the thing that always got to me is um, you won't miss it, you know, with the with the meat, with beef and pork. And it's like, like, heck, I won't miss it. My dad is, you know, huge beef eater. Yeah, he's got heart disease and a big stomach and all that kind of stuff. But he grills almost every night. You know, we'd have sirloins and I mean, every night it was steak and potatoes and sour cream and butter. And uh, no wonder he died of a heart attack at 70. Um and his heart disease became bad enough that I had to mow the lawn because his cardiologist said it would strain his heart and so on. So I would tell dad what Jack was saying and dad would say, yeah, but 
he's a gym rat, you know, he's not a doctor. And I would tell that to Jack and Jack would say, well, I became, I was going to become a doctor, but I decided to do this for prevention to, you know, stop people from having to go to the doctor when it's too late. And, uh, uh, and my dad would say these other low carb dieters that he was following, Dr. Carlton Frederick's low carb diet published in 1965, super popular. He was, he would get 10,000 letters a week because he was a radio star. And that book sold, I don't know how many copies. The doctor's weight loss. This was, um, uh, Erwin Maxwell Stillman's, this one in the early sixties already had 4 million copies sold. Medically proven. Medically proven, yeah. <laughs> Medically proven low carb diet. And these were just building on the, the diets that had been popular in the 50s and 30s and 40s. In fact, I somewhere I have here my grandparents' book of health from the 30s. Um, and it was a low carb diet because carbohydrates caused fermentation. So, and my grandparents were overweight, you know, quite overweight. Um, and I... I lived with my grandfather till he, till I was seven. I know why he was overweight, because our normal, his normal breakfast was white bread, which was we all loved Wonder Bread, white bread, and he would slather it with butter and sprinkle sugar on it, white sugar on it, and cinnamon, and that was breakfast. <laughs> so, you know, ultra pro he was eating ultra processed food basically, but he was doing the processing. Right. And that's what I was eating for breakfast too. And I was getting fat too. Mm -hmm. So you're catting. It was John, wasn't it? Who you were catting for? Jack. Lovely. Jack. <clears throat> and his, he starts to rub off on you a bit in terms you, of. You must be Australian because he was so famous in America. <laughs> um, this guy, Jack LaLanne. Okay. Have you ever done Jack, jumping jacks? Yes. They're, that's, that's him. Jack. Okay. Jack and this is quite the library that you've got. How do you get all of these books? <laughs> oh, you know, I've collected a lot of them over the years. I inherited a few of them like this one. Um, but I like rare old books and I buy them from booksellers and off eBay and, you know, places like that. It's amazing <laughs> to see how these diets are just still around today. It, they, yeah. They, they take on perhaps a slightly new name or, or new twist. Yeah, well, I have a story about that if if I'm not telling too many stories. No, we, we um, love the stories here. <laughs> so, um, oh, here's a very popular carnivore diet book from 1880. Um, Dr. John Salisbury popularized the carnivore diet. And, you know, she was pretty famous. Elma Stewart was pretty famous. And she wrote this book that had multiple printings on the carnivore diet. And it Oh, it was popular for, I don't know, 40 years. It's been popular many times in history. I think uh, even Teddy Roosevelt was a big fan of it. And he died when he was 60 of thrombosis. What kind of evidence are they citing in that uh, kind of book? It was an anecdotal evidence, but it was experiments that John Salisbury did on himself and on, um, he would have people come visit him for a while and feed him just beef. Um, he thought fiber was the killer because of fermentation. So he tried to... The Salisbury steak, which he's named after him, uh, is a high-end hamburger, but it basically tries to remove the fibrous tissues that would create, turn into sugar and create, you know, fermentation. And um, so, but it was, you know, mainly anecdotal evidence, even though he was a pretty good scientist. Um, but he, he would just bring in people and, and feed them for six weeks, you know. Was he in your how long to health influences yeah. Live. He video. lived to 82, which is oh. about as I could only ever find anybody who was a high meat eater who uh, made it in their early 80s. That's as far as I could find. And I searched and searched and searched. Yeah. Maybe give us the, the, <clears throat> the top line takeaways from that series. What were the main themes, I guess, that you noticed? Yeah. So the main themes were there were about um, that series was about health influencers who'd written books and had become quite influential in the industry. So there are about a hundred of them that I studied. And, um, and I wanted to know how long did they live? And it turns out uh, they went all the way up to 111. There's a Chinese nutrition scientist, 111 years old. I read this book. <laughs> I used Google Translate <laughs> to, to read that book. It's kind of boring. Be optimistic, eat a plant dominant diet, don't eat too fast, walk after you eat, eat with people, 
Okay, I just summarized the whole book for you. Um, and Japanese diet, but this guy lived to 105. Same, same message, but he's Japanese. Um, so we had people who lived all the way up to 114, um, and uh, quite Ansel Keys lived to 100. The, the core members of his team, uh, Jerry Stamler lived to 102, Ansel lived to 100, and uh, Henry Blackburn's doing really well now at 97. So their diet didn't kill them. <laughs> um, and um, so anyway, I studied these people on how long they lived. Um, and, um, you know, there were vegans who lived to 104. Uh, well, vegetarian for half his life and then vegan for the second half of his life. Uh, there was the vegetarian strongman who lived to 104, but he only he swam in the ocean every third day and he walked five miles every morning. And the only reason he died at 104, uh, eating almost exclusively plants, was that he got run over by a car, you know. So... Um, so basically, I tried to, you know, it's 100 people. It's, it's not a scientific survey, but, it, but it's interesting. And uh, so I would uh, look at how much education. So on, on the first one, I noticed that list of people who made it to 100 or more, um, they were all very highly educated and they were all plant dominant. Um, didn't have to be totally plants. In fact, they could eat a little bit of red meat. One of the, the one who lived to 114, she was a pediatrician who practiced till she was 102. And she, um, she would eat two ounces of beef every other day, something like that. So dose response, a small amount was fine, didn't seem to make any difference. Um, but the ones who ate a lot of beef and saturated fat and so on, you know, there were bodybuilders who died at 57, you know, or younger. Um, you had um, Bob Harper have his major heart attack when he's 40, uh, 52 on a low carb diet. And then Dean Ornish got a hold of him and he, he wrote this book called Super Carbs because he converted over to super carbs, but it didn't sell because nobody wants to eat super carbs. They want to see that if you, if you eat liver, you become like the liver king and you can have ab implants too. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, uh, it's the wild, wild west out there. Yeah, so the main things were education, happiness, um, sense of purpose, mm -hmm. uh, and um, plant-dominant diets. Plant-dominant. Which brings me to something that was said uh, last weekend. I went to Stanford's health conference symposium, and um, I had never heard of uh, the first scientist who spoke to us, Deborah. Um, mm, I can't remember her last name. It starts with K. Um, she's a gerontologist, uh, especially in osteoporosis. And uh, she was asked at the end of her speech, which was riveting. Everybody loved it. It's going to be online. Uh, what's the single most important thing you could do? And I expected, oh, is she going to say lean into plants? Because that was kind of the theme of the conference. Eat at least 75% of your calories from whole plants. Uh, in, in plants, exercise, she might say that, happiness. Um, but she didn't say any of those things. She said sense of purpose. Mm. That's the number one thing for her. So I thought, hmm, okay. This is quite fascinating. I feel like you've found a good, clear yeah. sense of purpose with yeah. what you're doing now with plant chompers. Yeah, definitely. You feel that? I do. And I w didn't do it for a selfish reason for sense of purpose for my own because i could have been very happy doing youtubes on photography <laughs> maybe even i mean it's more fun you get to fly a drone and you get to do ice climbing and all that kind of stuff and really fantastic photography stuff and you get nothing but accolades in the comments section and you get millions of views <laughs> i mean what's not to love about it and it boosts my the, the businesses that my kids now run so a financial interest in it but i decided to do this and you've you're very well versed at the rage comments you get and you know <laughs> and i don't get as many views the carnivores get all the views um and uh but i still love doing it even though i don't get to do all the fun things um i still love doing it and it does give me a sense of purpose and i feel like it's just so much more important than anything else i could do because it's your friends and family and population health people's health it's making a more livable earth. It's the unimaginable cruelty we're inflicting on animals that could be reduced. 
So yeah, it's my sense of purpose and I'm going to stick with it for the rest of my life, however long that is. Are you familiar with the term ikigai? Uh, and it's been a while. It's a Japanese word that essentially is used to describe one's purpose. Hmm. You know, um, the Japanese tend not to think about retirement hmm. because what they're doing, they're doing, they, they love what they're doing. It's usually beneficial for their community. Don't retire. That was one of his leading commandments in this Japanese book. Don't retire. Right. Um, you mentioned conference before, and I remember listening to one of your videos where you may have interviewed Lisa Moscone or I, you, you had inserted some video of Lisa speaking. I did a whole episode on her, on cognition, mm. and she was the featured, so right. I used a lot of her clips. And she mentioned that I think she was at a, a, a brain cognition-related conference, and they asked the scientists to put their hand up um, to determine ha what type of dietary pattern they were eating. And it turned out that every single brain scientist there was eating a vegetarian diet, which I thought was really fascinating. Yeah, she called it a uh, plant-based diet. Um, that was actually a dinner. Um, there was a dinner and she had several colleagues there, but I attended some brain conferences um, at MIT and Stanford. They rotated back and forth every six months, it mainly focused on Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. Don't ask me why I was there, but they, they just like to cross-pollinate, you know, to get ideas because they've been so unsuccessful with Alzheimer's. You know, it's just... No drug has worked, um, and Parkinson's has been very difficult. They have electrical stimulation and things like that, but it's, both are very tough nuts to crack. So they've reached out to scientists from other fields to see, can we have any ideas here? Cross-pollinate a little bit. So I was there, and I saw what they were serving. You know, they always would say brain-healthy food. The MIND diet is the number one diet for them, for, for everybody but um, David Perlmutter, who's a neurologist who's it has different ideas. But as far as I could tell from those mainly brain scientists at that conference, 150 of them, they there was no controversy about diet. Mediterranean, the MIND diet, the DASH diet, vegetarian, vegan, they were all one of those. There was no red meat around or anything like that. There was no ultra-processed food. So, and and Lisa in her book, she's, she's written two books, great books. One's called Brain Food. And the other one is called the XX brain, meaning it's for women um, because women are twice as likely to suffer from Alzheimer's. And when they, the risk really grows is when they have menopause. There's some change in the brain. Um, but in the brain food book, she talked about the ketogenic diet. And she said to a neuronutritionist, it is our worst nightmare. So those are pretty strong words. <laughs> yeah, there was, I have never met, the, aside from David Perlmutter, I've never met you know, low carb brain size. Uh, I had to laugh at uh, Herman Ponce's in in his book Burn. He 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 mentions David Perlmutter. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You should interview him. He said David Perlmutter said in his book Grain Brain. He cites without evidence that we uh, evolved eating ninety five percent fat. <laughs> well, it's absurd. I mean, he he also said of of Dr. Finney. He said he should have hired an anthropologist <laughs> because Dr. Finney was, you know, likes to uh, reference the Inuit and they're not like us. We're not descended from the Inuit and they have a special mutation, so they can't go into ketosis. So, yeah, I think anyone who wants to understand what our ancestors ate and even how important that is, I guess, to thinking about longevity, Burn is is the book to read. Yeah, for consumers, definitely, uh, for sure. It, he's He's got another book that he co-authored with another guy on the evolution of man. It's more of an academic mm -hmm. book. It's in its third edition, um, and it's a great book too. So, Okay, so at what point do you start getting really interested in – food and how it's affecting the environment so i know that you recently did a ted you did a TED talk tedx talk yeah at dedicated mm -hmm. to um how agriculture is affecting the environment particularly land use yeah which was land a, and water and and i think that concept is critical for people to understand and, yeah. and make sense of but 
Is that a more recent thing for you that yeah. you've kind of dived into or back when you were working as an earth scientist, were you, were you researching that? You know, back in the earth scientist days, we were focused on greenhouse gases. And so um, cattle produce methane uh, and it's quite potent, but it eventually, you know, it's, it doesn't last as long as carbon dioxide. Um, and there's, you know, nitrous oxide from the ammonia in, in their poop and so on. Um, but we were just focused on the gases. And there are still some earth scientists who are very prominent, like Michael Mann, who's written some really good earth science books. And he's a vegan, but or he doesn't eat beef. Um, and But he's fo totally focused on the gases. Once you start focusing on agriculture, it becomes a different story. And I'd had some agricultural background in my earth science days from water testing, but I didn't, I never connected the dots back then. And it wasn't until uh, Joseph Poor at Oxford and Hannah Ritchie, um, who you've had on your show, that was a great episode, um, started talking about the impact of beef that I started looking at it more carefully. And oh my gosh, it's it's mind blowing. It's, it's just shocking. Right. Those some of those those graphs that our world and data have put together yeah. through Hannah Ritchie's work and Joseph Poor's research yeah. are. Um, I think some of the the best visuals on this topic. Unbelievable. I simplified the graph a little bit for my TEDx talk, but I, but it was right out of Joseph Poor's data. And for listeners who are listening to it on a podcast, four billion hectares is what the footprint of agriculture is today. And I know nobody can envision that. But if you just remove beef, it goes to two billion hectares. That's half, half of the land use if you just remove beef. And if you remove dairy, it's 1 billion hectares. So it's half again. So it's, and people think that a vegetarian diet is earth friendly, but it includes dairy if it's lacto ovo. Uh, and so a vegetarian diet that does not include uh, fish, pigs, and chickens has twice the land footprint of one that doesn't include dairy, but does include pigs, chickens, and fish. Very counterintuitive, but that's the data that Joseph Poor produced and Hannah Ritchie, you know, has produced the beautiful graphs on. And then on top of that, for the land use problem, the the footprint for land use of beef is uh, is 10 times or more what it is for chickens or pigs, monogastric animals. And they're almost 10 times what it is for plants. So it's 100 times more than like soybeans and nuts and, and all that stuff. And the water use issue is not much better. The 17 uh, states that comprise the Southwest that have the water crisis that where the Colorado River no longer flows into the ocean and we have to get rid of our lawns and all that kind of stuff. 6%, only 6% of the water footprint of those 17 states is for residential use, showers and swimming pools and all that kind of stuff. 8% is for commercial use, commercial buildings with fountains out front, motels and all that stuff. And the rest, 83%, comes from irrigated agriculture. And of course, we're going to have to eat, and ir irrigated agriculture is important, but not to the extent that 38% of the total water footprint is just for growing crops to feed cows, mainly alfalfa. And it's just shocking. Um, so, you know, my wife is very environmentally responsible, so we catch the shower water in a bucket and we pour it on our plants and things like that. <laughs> you know how, how much that influences the problem it's like lost in the round off error whereas eating burgers on the corner that's huge so it, very counterintuitive but the data is standing up so when joseph poor first published that data I, I my jaw went to the floor i almost dislocated my jaw but it seems to be holding up how much of this do you think is personal responsibility versus like if we're thinking about mainstream adoption of a shift in diet towards a diet that is using or is allows us to free up a lot of land, and maybe we can speak to why that's important, but free up a lot of land, use a lot less water. How much of that do you think is is going to come down to individuals taking action themselves versus governments changing the food system? 
It's a very good question to, to accurately describe the problem. 95% of deforestation today is in our rainforests all over the world. And the big one that we're all worried about is the Amazon. Um, the deforestation just over the last 20 years, just 20 years, is equivalent to the land area of the UK, Ireland, the Netherlands, Poland, Germany, and one other of those European countries combined over 20 years. You see that on a map and you just, oh. And 80% of the deforestation in the Amazon is coming from uh, the raising cattle, leather for our car seats, and also to eat burgers. And the other 20% is mainly coming from soy to feed pigs in Asia because pork is quite popular in Asia. Sorry about bumping the microphone. Uh, so um, that's all, you know, just like super shocking. And I don't think people understand, not even nutritionists understand how damaging beef is to your health. For example, I did this episode on hyperpalatability with Tara Fazzino. She's a psychologist at the University of Kansas who runs the addiction center there. And there's this controversy around whether food can be addictive. Can, can something you have to eat three times a day, can you really classify that as addictive? But her observation is, well, the behavior that people are exhibiting when they eat certain foods is addictive behavior. So, um, so she started looking at, she and, um, and Kevin Hall decided, you know what, the food companies are way ahead of us. They've figured this out. We're just trying to catch up with all the things that they're doing. The artificial flavors, billion dollar, many multi-billion dollar companies just to come up with the chemical flavoring for Doritos. So three different cheese tones release on your tongue at different times, you know, and so on. And so she had this, this chart on the rise of hyperpalatability of foods. <laughs> it's so shocking. Just look at the rise of obesity from 1980 to today. And you can see why that is. And we associate that with ultra processed foods. So Doritos, uh, Twinkies and all that. Um, but in her research, she turned up the fact that it, it doesn't have to be as Michael Moss suggested in his famous book, Fat, Sugar, Salt. It only has to be fat and salt. And it can be very hyper palatable. All you have to have is whatever it is, 30% of calories coming from fat and a certain weight as a percentage of the food coming from sodium. And it can have no carbs and be hyper palatable. And it's like, ding, 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 what's going on here? Um, so I started looking um, uh, you know, at beef, for example. And I asked Tara and I asked Michael Moss, I called him up and asked, this trend towards marbling of beef is, is that making it hyper palatable? Is it getting above 30% fat and then you salt it and it becomes hyper palatable? And they didn't know. And Tara said, well, the research hasn't gotten there. So I started looking at what the cattlemen are saying about marbling beef. They get a higher price for choice cuts and, and whatever the highest cuts of beef are, um, choice and prime. And, um, and in order to get there, they have to get induced like Angus, the Angus breed of beef to get marbled fat in their muscles. And the way they do that, uh, they've been doing it by feeding them grain, which isn't their native diet. Uh, but the way they're doing it now is by uh, artificial intelligence driven breeding. And so they're getting the, the beef to be 65% fat. And that fat does not have a good profile. It's saturated fat. And it's only 35% protein. So um, you see people go to McDonald's and they get, <laughs> because they're low carbers, and they just get the, you know, Dr. Barry uh, just gets the hamburger patties from McDonald's. And I looked it up. It's 64% fat for those hamburger patties and enough salt to make them hyper palatable. So you think, oh, it's the, you know, the bun and the sauces, and, but the beef is a whole food, right? It's a whole food. Well, no, they've turned it into, a, in my view, a hyper-processed, hyper-palatable food before slaughter through very clever breeding. And so we have never, not in Herman Ponser's books or anywhere else in human history, we have never been exposed to a food like beef that has that level of saturated fat in it, no fiber, and people are thinking it's a high protein food, but it's, it's not a high protein food. Tofu is higher protein. 
fish is higher is high protein, you know, unless it's a really fatty fish. Yeah. The cynical side of me thinks that this we've gone so far now, it's gonna be very, very hard to sort of reverse out <laughs> yeah. of this food environment that we've created. Yeah. And the I guess the optimistic side of me just starts thinking about cellular agriculture and what Paul Shapiro is doing, yeah. for example, is that does that give you some hope? Those it does, types yeah. of industries, <clears throat> it does. So I heard about Paul Shapiro on uh, your podcast, and um, and I was riveted by the guy and his talk about meat tooth and so on. So I googled him and I saw that he had some really good TEDx talks, two hundred fifty thousand views, very compelling, great storyteller and everything. So I pestered him and pestered him <laughs> to let me come up to Sacramento with my camera and have him give me a tour of the facility. And he was very articulate and he was great. Um, and uh, the episode did pretty well. And I got enamored with mycelium. It's the roots of mushroom, they're naturally fibrous. So they're a lot like meat, but they have, you know, fiber, soluble fiber. They have B12, they, they're very high in iron. protein, iron, yeah, the whole thing. And it tastes it, great. Yeah, and they taste great. And, it, and you can flavor them all kinds of ways. They've got big successes with corn doing the, the vegan sausage in the UK that are super popular. So, uh, so I really loved that. And when I was giving my TEDx talk, I was helping them pick speakers too. And I suggested Paul. And so we went out there and, and uh, he attended my talk and I introduced him uh, there. And <laughs> the guy who was running TEDx there said, he's giving a commercial you know, for mycelium. And I kind of slumped in my chair a little bit and thought, you know, he's kind of promoting mycelium quite a bit at a conference. Maybe this isn't a good idea. But he titled the talk, Mycelium Can Disrupt Beef or something like that. And uh, and Ted picked it up, the big stage of Ted, not just TEDx. They picked it up and put it on their site. So it's not only on YouTube, but it's on TED itself. And wow. it's getting good views. I haven't views. seen that yet. Yeah, it's getting good reviews. It's a great talk. I was sitting right on the front row. And um, so we've become fast friends because of your podcast, and I keep bumping this mic. Um, and um, uh, and now there are these other companies that are getting funded quite a bit. Meaty is one of them, M-E-A-T-I. Mm -hmm. And they're out with um, um, carne cutlets or something like that. It's red meat slices that are 95% mycelium. A very few ingredients and apparently they're delicious from the reviews so yesterday i went to sprouts market where they're you know where they are and i was going to bring you okay. i was going to bring you some meaty and they were out of stock which i thought was a good sign um uh, but yeah as a substitute to beef that would just be oh it'd be my dream you know? uh, yeah i've had some of the corn products not bad huh? yeah they do a pretty good job with chicken yeah right um, I wish cellular would. agriculture, have you, have you looked at that? I have, yeah, and I've tried to get into Upside Foods to get an interview there. Um, and I noticed, you know, that you got to interview people from Just. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm very interested in it. I just think it's a long, hard road. Um, it reminds me of in the 70s, solar panel companies were all the rage and they went public and everything. And it took 40 years before we could really get them to compete in price with coal. Did Upside Foods, did they turn into Every Day or the Every Co or is that a different company? I don't know. I hadn't heard that. Well, the Every Co is they're focusing on eggs and, yeah, and egg like protein, mm -hmm. right? And um, there are so many like packaged foods with egg white ingredients. In yeah, them. yeah. So that's, you know, I think, I think some of this is difficult when you are first bringing these new products to the market mm -hmm. to get people enthusiastic about trying them. Yeah, it <laughs> sounds disgusting. Yeah. yeah, it can sound a little bit Black like Franken food. Yeah, yeah, and so there's a bit of a barrier there. Yeah, but where the where them they may be able to get a little bit more traction early is when it's an ingredient within an existing food. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so. Can you walk me through how an earth scientist <laughs> spends 10 years <laughs> in the industry and then somehow starts working with Steve Jobs? Hey friends, are you ready to take your fermented food game and gut health to the next level? Look no further than my digital guide, 
plant-based ferments. Inside, you'll discover some of my favorite recipes, including my soy labneh and homemade kombucha. Visit theproof.com forward slash ferments for more details. That's theproof.com forward slash ferments. Okay, that's enough from me. Let's get back to the episode. Well, so there were six of us who graduated from Stanford in, in my program and three of them died out in the field the first 10 years. One in a volcanic eruption, he was a volcanologist. He decided to dedicate his life to his friend who died on Mount St. Helens blast, and he died in one of the volcanic blasts. Um, so another one died in a helicopter on the North Slope, and another one in a truck accident in Wyoming. And so that you know, was sobering. And I was in Colombia, and there was a general strike, and the guerrillas came down from the hill. I was in Bogota. They came down from the hill and they spread nails all over the road so he couldn't go anywhere. And they had to put me, I'm tall white gringo, I don't belong there. Um, they had to put me behind bulletproof glass and lead shielding and everything. And I was there for 11 days with a book, Dying of Boredom. And I missed Halloween, which was my kid's favorite celebration of the year. And um, uh, when I came home, you know, and I had been other, in geophysics, you're in high risk situations a lot um, out in the field. And, and so I'd been in a lot of those. And when I came home, my oldest son had written a book report on Steve Jobs in seventh grade, The Journey is the Reward. While all the, all the other, we were living in Houston, all the other kids were doing book reports on football players or presidents. And he was skinny and kind of a geek and didn't fit in with, he had this small club called the Brain Brothers, but um, he just didn't fit the vibe. So he wanted to have a family caucus and they sat me down and said, dad, we can't relate to what you're doing and you're taking all these risks. And why don't you go to work for Steve Jobs? He's changing the world. And it's like, I, I'm 37 years old. I'm a geophysicist and I make a lot of money. And I, I was ashamed to say that, um, but I thought of it. And, uh, and they just looked down at their feet. They couldn't understand. My kids just couldn't understand that. And it got to me, just seeing that really got to me. So there was a, a computer convention in the day. We did a lot of simulations on computers. So we used Sun workstations a lot, Unix powered workstations. Um, and um, there was a computer symposium called Comdex. It was the biggest symposium. And you could buy tapes of the conference and all the debates, the round tables and everything afterwards, cassette tapes for $450. <laughs> so I bought them and started listening to them in a Walkman while I'm mowing the lawn and walking and we're driving. The kids are going crazy as I'm doing this. And, um, and uh, <clears throat> I think I got myself articulate enough so I could speak the language and knew what the key issues were. Um, <clears throat> and um, I read everything I could about Steve. It seemed so unlikely, I mean, honestly. And I decided to leave my career, you know, at age 37, we rented a U-Haul truck and towed the Honda Accord behind it all the way to California. We rented a house and we had some friend find a house for us. And I started- so this is early nineties? 1990. 1990. And Steve had, had he, he had previously been working at Apple yeah, but, and was fired. Well, he had disagreements with John Scully <laughs> and it's a long story. Um, I think it was mutual, but Steve, was the master of PR, so he was gonna be the victim. Anyway, uh, I mean, he was infant terrible. I, he was very difficult in those days. So um, when my best friend who I'd started my that company with, that, that Western Geophysical bought, uh, heard I was doing this, he said, you can't just, you know, the geophysicists just come here without a, you know, a job. I'll give you a job at Stanford. You can be a visiting scientist. And so I was visiting scientists at Stanford for a year and he was Israeli and he had studied earthquakes over 4,000 years looking at archeological ruins in Israel. Fantastic. We only had seismograms for a hundred years. That was short in terms of the kind of studies we, the epidemiology we did. And here were, he had fault scarps from, you know, 4,000 years ago. And um, so, I got really interested in the story. I called up Nova, they came and interviewed him and they said, it's not science because there's no seismograms. So I called up National Geographic and they said, well, they can't do anything that's sensitive but biblically or any, you know, citing the Bible in it and everything. They have to keep their borders open all the time. I understood that, I respected that. 
So I said, Amos, I've always had a passion for photography, videography, and so on. If you just want to go to Israel, I'll film it. And I rented a $30,000 Ikigami camera. Uh, and, uh, and off we went uh, to Israel. And we um, went everywhere. We went to Jericho. We went on the West Bank where the Jordanians were pointing machine guns at our chests. And um, we went where the Intifada was, the whole thing. And uh, fantastic. He knew all the archaeologists and just fantastic. And I was feeling so inadequate filming this, thinking, oh, we need a professional crew. This is insane. We did have uh, a guy who helped with a second camera, but basically this was on me. And I was hoping I could do something worthy of public television. And in the day, you basically had to film in film you had to compete with Nova or National Geographic. And I was filming on, on uh, tape, um, beta cam. And so uh, we came back to the Bay Area and I decided, okay, I'm supposed to do, be doing earthquake simulations and things like that, environmental simulations on supercomputers at Stanford. And here I am editing, you know, this together. And I said, you know, I can't do a public television quality documentary for you, Amos, but I can do a 35 minute thing that you could show in your classrooms and other universities can show. So we agreed to do that and I couldn't resist the temptation and you know, it was a 54 minute format for PBS and I couldn't resist it. And I, I kept working on it until it was 54 minutes long. Exactly. I interviewed Amos at Stanford and then this, the Loma Prieta earthquake happened, uh, while I was on the phone with Amos, <laughs> it was too unbelievable a story anyway. Um, and, um, so we put all that in, in the video and at the end of it, I just felt like a poser, you know, just you know, inadequate. And I thought, I, I can't submit this to PBS. It's just not good enough. Um, so Amos went behind my back. I mean, he funded it. So he went behind my back and he entered it in the National Educational Film Festival, which embarrassed me a little bit because Nova, National, everybody's in the National Educational Film Festival. And he entered it and didn't tell me. And later on, he said, hey, we won an award at the National Educational Film Festival. You want to go with me to San Francisco for the ceremony? And, uh, and I said, you, you did what? <laughs> <laughs> so I, you know, put on a blazer and we went up to San Francisco and sat in the audience and, uh, and I was assuming that Amos would accept the award, but he was, you know, saying, no, you're going to go up on stage and accept it if, if we, if we win something. And it just turns out I was sitting beside Charles Chiasen, the director of the Nova documentaries. He did one on the Loma Prieta earthquake who said, it wasn't science. I mean, Amos is in the National Academy of Science. He's chairman of the Stanford, you know, geophysics department. Why is this not science? What are you talking about? Anyway, he didn't view it as science. And uh, so when they read the award winners for the science category, they read off third place and it was National Geographic, well-deserved. Um, and when they read off second place, I was wondering, you know, who's gonna top National Geographic? Mountains, it was, um, the walls came tumbling down, Amos Neuer and Chris McCaskill. And time just stood still. And I'm standing beside Charles Jason thinking, I, I'm gonna go up on the stage and get second place. Wow. And who got first place but National Geographic Mountains of Fire. And so they got to go to the Academy Awards um, competition because they were a notch above us. So we didn't get to go to the cat. I mean, come on, you know, it was amazing. And, uh, and it played all over the world. I had my friends, Tell me, oh, there's the most fascinating documentary. Why did you, why did you doubt it at the beginning? It uh, seemed, this seems like a bit of a recurring theme with you. It's a recurring you, theme. You, you, you sort of um, doubt your own ability and can't, can't see your brilliance. Well, I don't have brilliance. But <laughs> when I gave my TEDx talk in the fall, it took them three months to edit it. But as soon as I walked off the stage, I was so upset because I just wasn't on that day. I don't know why I just wasn't on. I don't do memorized talks very well in the first place. And there's so many restrictions with Ted and I had to keep them in mind, it was distracting. And I couldn't read the teleprompter and I had thought I would be able to, but the lights were too bright, I just couldn't do it. So I was upset. I told the organizer, you know, I can edit it, you know, to help it along, but ugh, I had pregnant pauses and everything in there. And then when he published it, I couldn't watch it for three months. I couldn't watch it until last week because I just didn't want to see myself flailing around on stage looking like I knew I was. And 
my wife kept telling me, it's fine, it's fine. It wasn't your best, but it's fine. You did a good job. And um, so finally last week, I forced myself to watch it as, you know, as a debt to Paul Shapiro, who was promoting it and TEDx wanted to promote it. And I looked at it and it was, it was fine. It just took me three months to get over it. It wasn't my best, but it was fine. And I, that's been the theme of my life. I've done that a lot. And I don't know if it, that got deep in my soul from being a kid on the streets, you know. Um, I, I don't know why, but I felt like that with nutrition too. What am I doing in nutrition as an earth scientist? And boy, you better believe I felt that way when I'm working for Steve Jobs. And um, at General Magic, you watched that documentary. Pretty yeah. good documentary, huh? Incredible. Yeah, wasn't that great? Wow. Yeah. I cannot believe I had not seen that. Or yeah. And there was a there's a quote in there uh, at the beginning that this is possibly the most important company out of Silicon Valley that no, no one's, one's ever heard of. of. Yeah. And I I was you know just blown away yeah. with that story and and sort of um, the creative geniuses that were involved. Yeah. And they didn't profile the most, the biggest creative genius there, Bill Atkinson, who is our chairman. He's a good friend and I am in awe of him. He, once again, Ansel Keys stature, you know, he, the dude is one of the brightest who's ever been in Silicon Valley. It's incredible. I mean, I, I only obviously understand bits and pieces of it, but to think that uh, eBay, Android. Yeah, my friend um, Pierre. <laughs> there was people in in that group who went on to to be really important in the development of the iPhone. Yeah. Like, Tony Fidel. Tony was a junior engineer. We finally gave up and hired him because he camped on our doorstep every day. We could hire anybody and you know everybody wanted to be there because Andy was there and Joanna Hoffman was there and they were famous and Bill Atkinson who was just genius. Okay, let's let's take one step back and then come back to general <laughs> okay. general magic because you kind of glossed over the Steve Jobs yeah. thing. So yeah. so you you have that year where you're shooting the, the documentary, yeah. you win, win your award, yeah. and then is it sometime shortly after that that you you end up working with Steve Jobs? Yeah, so I got fascinated in Next, um, partly because of Don, but also partly because I thought the concept behind the computer was incredible. Because we all love the Macintosh, but the operating system was brittle. It didn't have good security. It didn't have memory protection, so one app could crash the whole machine, cherry bombs all over the place. and um, and it couldn't do multiprocessor. There were a lot of things that we wanted from it, it couldn't do. So uh, when Steve went to Next, <laughs> unfortunately, the original vision was just to get revenge on John Scully, um, which caused us to lose some really good people because they just didn't want to do a revenge on John Scully kind of, I'll tell you a funny story about that. Steve had these black Porsches uh, that were air-cooled 911 S's with the, the Targa. With beautiful the, cars. Oh, beautiful cars. And um, I had one detailed and I was gonna move it up in front of his office on the stairs and my wife stopped me. We were gonna do it for April 1st, you know, to, and put a red rose with a sing, uh, in a crystal vase on it because that's what he had in every one of his keynotes that he gave. And, um, but anyway, along the way, he got a silver Mercedes. What? <laughs> a kind of a puffy silver Mercedes. It didn't have any character. That's how it. That's not Steve, but it had a cell phone in it that he really liked. That was voice activated in 1992, and he thought that was so great. So he took me and Mike Slade out into the parking lot to show us this voice activated cell phone. It was so great, and Mike turned to me afterwards and said, "We got to figure out how to get him to get rid of that car. That's out of character." Mm -hmm. So we decided to compliment him, saying, "Yeah, John Scully just bought one of those." <laughs> And it was gone so fast. <laughs> it's just Steve was so emotional back then, which made him great. You know, it, it was once again his greatest weakness and his greatest strength all rolled up into one. Do you remember the first time you met him? Yeah, that was kind of scary. They protected us in the beginning. Um, so when I was at Western Geophysical, a lot of our work was in the Middle East. And so we did a lot of people with his heritage. He's Syrian and Jewish combination, quite a combination, and, and orphaned. Um, and, um, and he had a lot of sort of Middle Eastern sort of characteristics and temperament. And I was, I was pretty used to that. So when I first met him and he came after me, you know, with his insults and things, it didn't really bother me too much because I was used to it. And other people around me could see that it, it didn't bother me so much. And it's like, oh, you, you know, you're on the, uh, the, 
we called it the shithead roller coaster, you know. <laughs> and sometimes you're up on Steve's list and sometimes you're down. And, um, and you're down, you know, what are you doing at this company was kind of Steve's attitude. And, uh, and it, you know, that had some effect because I didn't feel qualified to be there. Um, but you could see quickly what we all knew, that he was the dumbest person any of us had ever met and the smartest person all rolled up into one. He could see things no one else could see, but he couldn't see the obvious. And I somehow I got assigned to debate him all the time <laughs> on the things that he just couldn't see. And I wasn't always sure, uh, you know, that, that I was right. It was very difficult with Steve because first off, his clock speed runs faster than yours or anyone else's, except for Ross Perot, who was on our board, who could speak at the same rate that Steve could. He has access to people that you don't. Oh, I just called uh, the CEO of IBM and he told me blah, blah, blah. Well, you don't have a, that access. And, um, and he's larger than life because he started Apple and you didn't. So he has his way, he has five ways to get his way when he's wrong. And the last of them, I saw the pattern was to personal insults. Oh, you're immature, you know. And I had so much trouble when he would do that with me because I would be stroking my chin like this. What I was really doing is holding down the corners of my mouth so I didn't smile and infuriate him because I thought if the great Steve Jobs has gone all five levels and he has nothing left, but he's got to insult me, well, I'm just going to go away because I just won. And three days later, magically, Steve will have changed his mind and he's not going to give you credit for it. Not in those days. He, he changed. So he was a little difficult to work oh, with. Oh, he was very difficult in those right. days. But you, but I, I adored him because he wanted to change. He wanted to put a dent in the universe. He, he, was just a, this tortured soul who had to have perfection on everything. Every last pixel had to be just perfect. And, <laughs> you know, we always used to say, you know, great is the enemy of good or something like that. Uh, good, I don't know, whatever that saying is. Perfection is the enemy of good. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. So, uh, but with Steve, it had to be perfection. You just had to deal with it. It had to be perfection. And one of his buttons was style. And his great rival was Bill Gates, and we were down and out. You know, Pixar was failing. I was working a little bit with Pixar, and Next was failing, um, and and Bill Gates was ruling the world, um, and um, and Steve hated that. But Steve kept saying, "Yeah, but he has no sense of style. His mother dresses him. He wears cardigan sweaters." People who care about style will buy our computers because our computers are stylish. And, and you know what? People didn't really care that much about style for a desktop computer. They just didn't. But it turns out when the iPod came along, people cared about the white iP AirPods or earbuds, uh, earbuds, and they cared about the look of. Microsoft came out with a brown music player. It looked like a piece of cabbage. Everybody would move away from it. You know, it was like, ugh, I'm not going to buy that. And that thing bombed. Whereas Steve had this great sense of style. And even though he was late with the iPod, it was just the, the product to have because it was a fashion accessory now, not like a desktop computer. And the iPhone became that. And, you know, you look at the stuff that he's really succeeded with. They're the ones where style matters. <laughs> and and he, has, he just has great sense of style. So right. Yeah, I had. think when you think of Apple now, you think of design, design, sophistication, yeah, minimalism, yeah, ticks all of those boxes, and it stood the test of time. Yeah, and I mean, <clears throat> his passion to make things simple was beyond the pale. He didn't even want a power button. He didn't want oh, the lectures we would get. You know, I would always on the dialogues. I would always want a confirmation. Um, uh, it's funny, all these stories that come back. So I told you Bill Atkinson was one of the great geniuses of Silicon Valley. <clears throat> Steve recruited him out of University of Washington, where Stefan Guillenay graduated from. He was a neurologist, getting his PhD in neurology. And Steve recognized how bright he was. And Steve had this passion to just hire the brightest people, the best in the world, wherever you could find them, 
with varied background. He had this analogy that you put them like rocks in this grinder with oil and they smooth out and get along, eventually get along with each other and they cross pollinate each other. And he spent a whole day recruiting Bill Atkinson as employee number 38 at Apple. So when it came to the Macintosh, Bill could see they didn't have a graphics model and he didn't shower, didn't sl he slept under his desk and everything else to make the launch date and he invented QuickDraw, which was an, an unbelievable achievement to invent the graphics of the Macintosh in the time frame that he did. And, you know, it, it was modeled after the Xerox Star. They were copying the Xerox Star. And, uh, and Bill thought he saw overlapping windows for the Xerox Star. He didn't, but he thought he saw it. So he said, we're going to have overlapping windows. <laughs> and that's how Switcher came about. And to show off Quick draw, he wrote Mac Paint and Mac Draw. To show off the programming capabilities, he wrote HyperCard. He did all this. He wrote 70% of the code of the original Macintosh. If he hadn't done that, if Steve hadn't spent a day recruiting a neurologist out of University of Washington, there would be no Steve Jobs and no Macintosh, you know, because the Apple II was fading. And, and um, So was this still while next computers? This was at Apple. This was at Apple. So was at Steve Apple. had gone back to Apple? No, this is next. before Next. Okay. And this is what got him pushed out of Apple because the pirate flag and they were doing the Macintosh when the official project was the Lisa, which was going to be a $10,000 computer that was going to compete in office spaces with a Xerox star and all that. Um, but to illustrate that Steve didn't stop there, he wanted this cross-pollination. Uh, there was a woman that you saw in the General Magic documentary who I adore, uh, Joanna Hoffman. Um, She's a very short, feisty Jewish woman with English as her fourth language. She grew up in Russia as a Russian Jew. She had to leave and go to Poland, learn Polish. Then they went to Paris where she went to high school and college, I think, learned fluent French. And then she came to America and she got her PhD at the Oriental Institute in Middle East Archaeology. What is a Jewish woman doing learning getting a PhD in, what was she thinking? So I asked her about that and she said, oh, well, the Shah of Iran was still in power and I could do my archeology span in Iran. Well, as soon as he fell, that was the end of that. So she came to Silicon Valley in search of what to do next. And she attended a lecture that somebody gave about Apple computers, about the Macintosh and the user interface. And she started asking questions and they thought her questions were so intelligent. They interviewed her and true to form for Steve, he just will hire somebody brilliant. And I'm telling you, Simon, that she is brilliant. And I have never known someone who's not a native speaker write like she can write in English. For example, you know, uh, Mark Twain said the, the difference between the right word and the almost right word is the difference between lightning and the lightning bug. Um, and Joanna internalized that. So when we were working on general magic and we're doing this communicator where postcards would go up into the sky and we had to name what is that data center in the sky and all that. And I think it was Joanna who said, let's name it the cloud. <sighs> it's brilliant. <laughs> Not the data center, or, you know, or any of the things that IBM would have named it or at t or something like that. And I was funny this morning, I was Googling, where do I just remember that we invented the name cloud and it had to be Joanna because it's so Joanna's foot fingerprints are all over a name like that. Um, and no, I looked on the internet and Google said very confidently it was Compact Computer who invented it in 1996. That was the first, and Wikipedia has that. It was the first, I got to edit this Wikipedia article. Um, it was the first implementation of the word cloud. So I pulled up an old video I have in 1993 of General Magic. We were using cloud. That's what we did. We named it cloud. It was in all our drawings and diagrams and everything. I don't know why it wasn't in the documentary. We didn't think to do that. <laughs> well, that's a good pickup. Now you can make sure it's yeah. attributed to her. Yeah. I'm going to call her up uh, when I get back and say, Joanna, did you come up with the word cloud? Um, because we got to get proper credit for that. It's a genius word. So general magic, maybe give people who have, haven't heard of it and haven't seen the documentary. What was general magic? Yeah. So... Um, we didn't know. I was at Next and I was in charge of developer relations. So there was a team of 35 people and we were trying to get people to write software for the Next and teach classes and programming and all that. And one of our former instructors, had, who was a star, had gone to General Magic and she was employee number 21. And she called me up and said, you got to come over here. You just got to come over here. 
we're doing something you, and we're not going to be able to tell you what it is. You just have to join. And Joanna Hoffman is here and Andy Hertzfeld, Bill Atkinson. This is, is the dream team that the best Silicon Valley has ever produced. You got to join us. So geophysicist me went over to General Magic and interviewed and got the job just like that. Okay, what's my job now? <laughs> what is this thing? And it turns out we called it a personal communicator. And the drawings looked, you saw in the documentary, the drawings looked a lot like the iPhone 6, and the concept was the same, except the user interface implementation was different. We had postcards, and you were going to write with a pen or the postcards, because screens in those days didn't have enough resolution, and you, they weren't sensitive enough you know, to really use your finger much. You had to use a pen to write. So we would just send these postcards into the sky and to the cloud, and they would fall down on somebody else's device. So it was personal communicator. You could talk on the phone uh, with it, um, and then it had your calendar and everything else. And I was to establish a developer program so that people could program for it. So we had to develop the developer kit. How? What are the cards that you'd use to plug into it to transfer the program over? What would be the pricing policy? You needed an app store and all that kind of stuff. And um, one of our first developers, I love these two guys, um, did a company called Lighthouse, and they had the idea that if you're moving around with this thing and you got wireless connectivity, you'd like to navigate. So why don't we load some maps on there? And if you search for an address, we can bring that up on a map and we can give you turn-by-turn -turn instructions. Revolutionary. Did you know at the time when you were doing this that collectively you were involved in something pretty monumental? Yeah, that, that once we saw the vision. Once we saw the vision, all of us were riveted. You want to talk about purpose in life. There wasn't anybody at General was Magic. Mark Porat. Mark Porat, yeah. He's, he was the kind of, he was the CEO like Steve Jobs was of Next. Yeah, yeah. How did he differ in terms of his leadership? Well, no one was ever able, and still to this day, able to make a presentation like Steve could. <laughs> Steve was the master of the stage. I helped him with a lot of those presentations, and believe me, a month of rehearsals and late nights and everything else went behind every nuance of those presentations. He worked at that. And if he wasn't on that day when he had some off days, he would make somebody else give it. I had to give a couple of them. Um, and um, so Mark was good, but not at Steve's level. But the thing about Steve is he got down to the implementation, all the fine details of implementation. And Steve had these notions. He got this from Alan Kay, who said, in order to design great software, you have to design the hardware. The two have to work together. They can't be separate. You can end up being like Microsoft, and the hardware won't quite match the software and all that. So he would not have done all the partnerships we did with Sony and Motorola and trying to adapt all their devices. It was complicated. But Mark would go do those deals. And it was great for Wall Street. We went public. Goldman Sachs took us public, and we raised $96 million on our public offering, even though we hadn't shipped a product yet, just because the vision was that strong. And Mark could communicate the vision pretty well, but not at the level of, no one was at the level this of This is mid-90s. 94. 94. So oh, well, well before the iPhone. 95. Oh, yeah. 12 years before the iPhone. Um, something like that. So when we got it ready, we decided to demo it to Steve. So here's what differentiated Steve from everyone else. He came over to our lobby. We equipped him with a, a General Magic device. And I had uh, the mapping software on a memory card. I wanted to give it to him. And he said, no, I, I, I think an application on this thing is a bad idea. It makes it more expensive, more complicated. You don't have control. of uh, Viruses could spread. It could crash the system. No, it's different than a computer. It should have everything built in. It should be simpler than that. And so he blew me off, you know, it's like, and this is one of those times where you think, can he see what no one else can see? Uh, or is this one of these cases where he's wrong and he can't see how powerful applications would be? Mm. And I decided, you know what, I think he's wrong. And that's a hard thing to say with Steve, you know, because he is so brilliant and uh, when he's brilliant. And so we kept going with those things and karma happened. <laughs> when the iPhone one was coming out, General Magic had failed, but that application turned into Google Maps and was changing the world, especially the way Larry and Sergey implemented it. I mean, with cars going around, mapping everything, pictures, and oh my gosh, the satellites and everything, they were amazing. 
Um, because they could see how big it was, as they could see with YouTube. They had a vision for YouTube when it was about to go bankrupt that no one else had. So um, <laughs> three weeks before the iPhone 1 um, announcement, Tony and all the other engineers at Apple said, Steve, and they, they had this method. They get in a room around him and Tony would say, <laughs> now, and they would all lean forward at the same time and say, Steve, <laughs> we have to have this mapping application. We have to have it. It's killer. We've got to have it. Google Maps. And so Steve, being Steve, calls up uh, Larry Page, who had tried to hire him, and said, we, you know, we've, we're coming out with this new phone and we've got to have this application. And we only have three weeks. And uh, can we program it ourselves? Can we get the source code? Well, that does not happen in the industry. No way. It's not possible. But Larry, being brilliant, one of the true greats, said, okay, Steve. And Sergey burned a CD right then with the source code on it. Steve hopped in his black Porsche, went over to Google, picked it up, brought it back. And in three weeks for the demo, they had Google Maps built into the phone. <laughs> but they didn't launch the App Store with iPhone 1 because Steve thought, you know, we don't need apps. I don't know how he thought that. Why, why do you think the iPhone was successful and when it came out, people were buying it versus General Magic? When that, when that came out, the response was kind of not as expected. Was it, is it a timing thing or was it the, the device itself? Both. Um, so when I was at Next, I told you we licensed FreeBSD, the I think I told you the Unix software, and we put our own graphical user interface on it, an application development environment. So that gave us protected memory, security, multiprocessor, all that stuff. Um, and we thought it was going to be fast and easy. It took us five years, five years of blood, sweat, and tear. It was so hard to do. But the engineers who did it, one of Steve's trademarks was do it right. Just Take the time and do it right if you have to. I'll keep the company alive somehow. He did that for Pixar with Toy Story too. It was supposed to take two years to do Toy Story. It took four. And Steve just said, make it great. Just make it great. You know, and that's why Toy Story was great. So we came up with this great operating system and we didn't have that for General Magic. We had to generate one from scratch and they're bloody difficult to do. It's the hardest thing you can do in software engineering. It's just It takes a special kind of person to do them. Um, who's a level above application developers or anyone. Um, they have to think about architecture carefully and everything. So our architecture wasn't as good, uh, for one thing. And that next step we called our operating system. Apple bought Next for $450 million. I helped with that sale, broker that sale. And, um, the, uh, and that drove the renaissance that became Apple because it became OS X and it's still OS 10 today. And when Tony was doing the iPhone, there was this whole question of, do we try to adapt that big operating system that's on our desktops and laptops to a little device? Or do we go with something lighter? And so they did a big evaluation and no, they used that. So next step, the thing that we blood, sweat and teared together for five years or more at Next, drove the renaissance of Apple OS 10 and it drove the iPhone and it is, still powers the iPhone today. It's what made the iPhone so great. And our operating system wasn't that good. Uh, as you saw in the documentary, you would get the spinning disk as it cleaned up files and things like that. Its memory management wasn't as good. Our operating system is a very hard thing. And not only that, but the components were more expensive. Battery life wasn't as good. We didn't have the Wi-Fi networks or the wireless networks then. So we were just, we were just too soon. And Steve had a much better sense of timing. So is the general sense that that general magic was a failure? Well, we thought so. We all hung our heads in shame, but we all got hired everywhere. Um, you know, the, uh, I mean, Silicon Valley recognized how concentrated the talent was there. So if you had general magic on your resume, the insiders, the venture capitalists all knew who you were something if you'd worked there. Um, so, you know, Tony got that job starting doing the iPod. Um, and, um, you know, that so, 
and like Megan Smith, who you saw in the documentary, she became uh, Obama's chief technical officer in the White House, and she was a VP of development for Google. John G. Andrea, who was a junior engineer there, I don't think we even mentioned him in the documentary. Um, he went on to become head of AI at Google, and he's now head of AI at Apple. I mean, <laughs> this was, you're not gonna get a brighter group than that. And the brightest of them all was Bill Atkinson, and he's too um, camera shy to be in the film. But I'll tell you a personal experience I had with him and the iPhone. By the time the iPhone 4, well, the, the iPhone 2 was what had the App Store, and it had it because uh, sales stalled, you know, pinch to zoom and all the nice things that that Apple copied from the Mission Impossible movie with Tom Cruise, uh, made it really sexy, but without applications, it just wasn't going anywhere. So Steve finally caved on the iPhone 2 and they did the App Store. Uh, but then it became clear after about the iPhone 4 that people were using it to take these crappy pictures with. Um, and they really needed to do it better. Well, Bill Atkinson had moved on into photography and had become the most respected technologist in photography. He drove, he wrote all the drivers for Epson printers and high-end, you know, printing presses that made their colors come to life and made them true colors and everything else. The guy is just he is one of the brightest people I've ever worked with in my life. And um, so iPhone, they're developing the iPhone 5 and Steve wants a good camera. Who is, who's he call? Bill Atkinson, of course. Who else would he call? And by that time I had, you know, these photography companies going and I was printing big photos and I was going to have lunch with Bill and everything. And he was sending me some of his email conversations with, with uh, the iPhone team, with Tony and the others uh, about how to make a great camera on the iPhone and do the right drivers and get the white balance right and things like that. He revolutionized the camera and damn, it's like you still can't beat an iPhone. If you're into photography, especially videography, <laughs> you're not gonna beat the video on an iPhone. And as smart as those guys are at Google and Samsung and everywhere, they still cannot match the iPhone. What's what's the, the computer museum that pops up in, in Mountain the documentary? View? Yeah, in Mountain View, um, we did. We, uh, I was on the stage there for the General Magic film. We we did an airing there, and then I answered questions from the stage along with uh, Mark Peratt. And um, yeah, the Computer History Museum. It's really interesting to go visit there. General Magic devices are there. You saw in the film that Andy Hertzfeld is visiting it, and uh, he said something I, I didn't totally agree with, but he said, uh, "I can tell that." Innovation is really for the young. Most of these innovators, most of these innovations are, are for the young. But how did he explain Steve with the iPhone uh, and Bill Gates? I mean, they, they were innovating some pretty amazing stuff, you know, late into their careers when they were the two old men in the industry. So, um, yeah, the Computer History Museum in Mountain View, if you're ever up there, come with me. I'll take you through it. And we can bring somebody like Andy or, or Joanna Hoffman, and they can explain some of that stuff to you. Not sure if it's a word that you used or it came up in the documentary, um, but there was someone said misfits. Yeah, exactly. And that that struck me because having watched your first TED talk as well, you you spoke about your uniqueness or weaknesses being your superpowers. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think there's just something special through that story about all of these people coming together who people may see as misfits or maybe themselves they see we were misfits. They, they, they felt like misfits yeah. but they were able to sort of tap into what is their ultimate strength yeah it's so amazing you know i've gushed about joanna hoffman all of them um joanna hoffman was played by kate winslet in the steve jobs movie and all of us who know joanna very well cannot tell the difference between kate and Joanna on the screen. Kate Winslet, and she got a Golden Globe for it. She was a misfit and she had a fiery temper. She'd just lose it, you know, in, a, in the middle of a meeting and start cussing like a sailor and storm out of the meeting and slam the door and everything else. And you think, wow, we got a bunch of misfits here. Steve, we, of course, Steve, in, he always had to have the best of everything. So we had to have the best ad agency in San Francisco. And 
they could talk to him and push back on him. Like with the next, he, he wanted to talk about how great the imaging language was and the color printer, which was 12 bit and the operating system, which, and the head of the agency glazed over and said, Steve, one thing, one thing. And Steve said, no, there's seven things, not one thing. And so he crumpled up five pieces of paper <laughs> without speaking and threw them at Steve and said, catch. And they went all over the place. And then he crumpled up one and said, catch Steve. And Steve caught it. And Steve said, okay, I get it. And Steve, you know, he had a strong emotion, but you could push back on him. And if you could give him something simple like that. So you notice in the Apple ads, I don't know if you ever saw these Apple versus Microsoft ads, one thing on a plain white background with just two actors and the computer stripped of everything. That was Steve and, and his marketing. So at that agency, Steve wrote an ad or they wrote an ad. I think it was a draftsman who wrote the ad actually. Uh, and it was, um, it's, it's beautifully worded, just amazing wording about, um, uh, I mean, we should pull it up and you put it in the episode or something, but it's how uh, people who think they can change the world are the ones who do. That's the concluding line. And in order to, oh, the, it's the crazy ones. It's all about the crazy ones. They didn't call them misfits. The crazy ones are crazy enough to think they can change the world. And the ones that are crazy enough to think that are the ones who do. And Steve believed that. He could change the world even though he wasn't the brightest guy around. Um, and um, and so the, the ad agency wanted him to narrate that. And he wouldn't do it for some reason. We don't know why. He wouldn't do it. So they got an actor to do it and it, and it became this wonderful ad. It's just this iconic ad. It's one of the best ads I think I've ever heard or seen. Um, but at his memorial, uh, when he died at Apple, they had this huge memorial at the Steve Jobs Theater and the plaza and everything. They played that ad with Steve's voice and everybody cried. You know, it's like, we're going to miss him forever. And he, Dean Ornish could have saved him. He had pancreatic cancer and your last episode, I thought of Steve the whole time when you interviewed Crystal and she said, don't think that you can cure cancer by diet alone. You have gotta go do chemotherapy or whatever the best treatment is. And Steve and his ideas about, you know, curing his pancreatic cancer with green smoothies. Mm. Was he a fruitarian? A uh, for a while, I didn't know oh. him when he was a fruitarian. Okay. It's funny uh, because at next, and not a lot of people were very health oriented. They were going out and having ham and cheese sandwiches and white bread and things like that. Uh, but by that time I was fairly health oriented. And so I would go out to this burrito place that was the precursor to Chipotle. And I would get, you know, brown rice and beans and all that stuff. And Steve saw me with that a few times and then he would always come and can get me, can get me lunch. And a couple of times he asked me if I was Seventh Day Adventist. And I didn't know why he would ask that. Um, I didn't know what a Seventh-day Adventist was really. Um, but so I just shrugged it off. I didn't want to get into a debate with him. Anyway, I'd bring him back all these burritos all the time and he would eat those. I had lots of dinners with him that were catered in when visiting dignitaries would come and there would be a salad and all of that. Um, but there was a plate of cookies. There were six cookies on this plate and they looked kind of healthy, whole grainish kind of cookies. But in the early nineties, they probably had a lot of Crisco in it, trans fats, and he loved those cookies trans fats and sugar. And he would go down on the whole plate of six cookies. And I always wondered what's in those cookies. I wouldn't eat them. Um, but I had a weakness for peanut M&Ms in the day because we had those around the building and I couldn't resist eating handfuls of those. I shouldn't have done that. What does it mean to you to, to think of your, um, your weaknesses as your superpowers, as you put it? Well, yeah. So that's interesting because, um, you know, I watch some of the influencers have such a sense of self-confidence. You know, I, I watched Paul Mason yesterday open his low carb down under talk by saying everything I learned in med school about cholesterol and LDL uh, was wrong. It was all nonsense. And I thought, you know, <laughs> there's some very good scientists who've and they're researchers. I consider that the top tier of evidence. 
when people who are actually doing the research, they're getting the grants, they're managing the teams, they're publishing in the good journals, they're getting accolades you know, from other very accomplished scientists. To me, that's the top tier. A general practitioner who's not doing the science and all that, to have that level of confidence. Well, so it's just never been, I've never, <laughs> I've ended up in all these occupations like what I'm in now saying, uh, you know, I don't have the master's in nutrition that that Simon has or the, the PhD and all the research that Christopher Gardner has. Um, so I question everything, you know, it, I better have, I better fact check everything. I better be able to put in the, in the description, you know, really good or else say on camera, I, it's my opinion, but I'm guessing, I'm not sure. Um, so I think that really helps because I think if you get too big a sense of yourself, I think most scientists are pretty, cons the good scientists are really conservative, you know, they're a little uncertain and, and, um, so I think that's one thing. I think another thing that turns out to be a strength and a weakness at the same time, um, most people's strengths are the weakness too, um, is having seen all these different industries in the playbook, you know, I can recognize what the food companies are doing like that because I saw it all in earth science with, with Exxon and it's the same, it's the very same playbook. And you, you wouldn't think, you see a journalist like Nina Teicholz or Gary Taubes, for example, and you think they look like good people. They wouldn't, you know, they probably just a little bit misled. And if they debated with Simon Hill, you know, they get on his show they'd probably come around a little bit and they'd meet in the middle or something, I don't know. But having <laughs> dealt with Exxon and Koch brothers and, and all the front groups and everything else, I mean, people go to work for Coca-Cola and they invent these programs to get youth to drinking Coca-Cola at a very early age in Brazil or whatever, and they know how bad that Coca-Cola is. And they know what's going on with the obesity crisis. They work for the cigarette companies and everything else. People will do that. So. Um, to give you an example, if I'm talking too much, you may have to cut some of this stuff out. Banting is an undertaker. In 1863, he writes a pamphlet, 14 pages, on how he lost weight. And he lost weight by listening to his uh, ear doctor tell him, uh, he wrote this letter on corpulence. Here's exactly what his ear doctor told him. The items from which I was advised to abstain as much as possible were bread, butter, milk, sugar, beer, and potatoes. Okay? Sounds like just the fattening foods that we all knew had known for ages. But to him, it was news because he was an undertaker. He didn't know anything about nutrition. So he did it, and he lost some weight. How about that? And so then Gary Taubes comes along and starts writing about nutrition. He has one conversation with... Uh, Ansel Keys on the phone when Ansel was in his 90s. And he gets the idea that Ansel was the worst scientist he'd ever met. And and he said so in, in several of his talks. I don't know how you get that first impression. And, you know, Gary wasn't doing any research. He wasn't a scientist. So, um, so he decides to write about the bad science. And he decides maybe Atkins had it all right after all. And that he could publish this New York Times magazine piece what if fat doesn't make us fat? And of course, he put the number one thing everybody wanted to see, steak and butter on the cover. Who doesn't want to believe steak and butter is good for you? The common thread through these tends to be, it starts with an anecdote, a personal experience. Yeah, yeah, exactly. There's anecdotes for every single diet in the world. The cookie diet. Right. You know, so... Um, the Twinkie diet. The Twinkie diet. Yeah, so he gets... From this art, he said in his books, he said he could not have published this article if it were just about promoting vegetables. And it had to be contrarian. It had to be something people wanted to believe that was different. Gary Taub says that. Gary Taub says that in his books. So Why would he uh, write that in the book? I don't know. It seems incriminating. Hmm. So, and then he said it got him uh, an advance on a book that could, so he could feed his family for four years. He's got a very nice wife, by the way, who's vegetarian. I've corresponded with her several times. Interesting. She's very nice, and they're raising their kids to uh, eat a lot of vegetables. <laughs> and um, 
And she's a very successful children's book author. She's delightful. Um, anyway, so Gary gets this advance to write the, the, his books. And in the books, he repeats back what he promotes banting, repeats back what he said, but eliminates the butter part of that sentence you heard me read. That's right in the book. He eliminates butter. How inexplicable is that? That he eliminates butter and calls it a low carb diet. And, you know, I just don't think you can say he doesn't know. He knows. So with all of these different books that you've read and interviews you've listened to, if someone is just thinking, how on earth do I decide which experts to pay attention to? Yeah. <laughs> have, you, have, you, have you been able to kind of formulate some way of determining that? Yeah, so my methodology <clears throat> is to look first and foremost at, uh, at the people who are actually doing the research. Research, career research scientists who are not funded by the food companies, but they're funded by, you know, something like the National Institutes of Health, like um, Kevin is. Um, they, um, and are actually implementing the research they are the top tier. They are the most knowledgeable. So is Roy Taylor on diabetes. It's he's, kept, Roy's phenomenal. Isn't he's it? phenomenal. He's phenomenal. He applied for all those grants, which took him five years to get or something like that, to get the MRI scanners. He figured out how to scan the liver and the pancreas, which is not easy to do. He figured out that when you get type 2 diabetes, the, the pancreas shrivels up. And then he did these randomized trials where he showed right. a lot of people can get their type 2 diabetes in remission just by caloric deficit. You know? That's how you do science. Yeah, he's great. Lisa Moscone, who runs the Alzheimer's Center, Christopher Gardner, who does his research at Stanford, the people who are actually doing the research. So what would you say if someone said, well, you're, you're just choosing people that support your diet? Well, they don't because I'm vegan. I know you are too. Um, I have six reasons for being vegan, um, and health is just one of them. But I couldn't look you in the eye and say, well, am I healthier being vegan as opposed to a Longo's diet of plant dominance with fish twice a week? I don't know. That would be very hard to make a scientific argument. Yeah, hard to make. And he might, you know, if you eat the fish, you get things like the carotenoid astaxanthin and the red one, you know, that is in lobster and shrimp and salmon and... And, um, and you get the omega-3s in the container that they're supposed to come in instead of a pill. Um, and so, you know, I don't know, but, but I, the diets that I believe in and I promote are ones that were exactly like that Stanford Symposium. 75% whole plant foods, more is better. The DASH diet, the MIND diet, the Mediterranean diet, the Asian diets. I think the, the two Japanese cohorts did the best in the seven country study of all the diets. Um, but Ansel Keys thought, ah, they're less likely to be adhered to for Americans. Americans' tastes are more Italian or something. Um, vegetarian, just look what the Seventh-day Adventists have done with vegetarian. They've become the longest lived population in the world right here in the United States, 30% black. And 40% of them are in high mortality states in the South. This is the last country you'd expect to see the longest lived population in the world who don't have genetics that predispose them to that. And the vegans do probably better than any of them of the Seventh-day Adventists. So, um, so I, you know, I can't say that vegan is the healthiest, but it's up there with the healthiest. Um, and then all the other factors, you know, deforestation and pollution and pandemics and pathogens and cruelty to animals. You know, there's a whole lot of reasons for doing it. So, um, but I still come back to my go-tos are the people who are actually doing the science. Unfortunately, they don't have time for social media and you don't know them and they're usually a little bit boring. They're mm -hmm. not good communicators or storytellers or writers. So you have to turn to, um, to, uh, science communicators who do, and that's you and Gil. Um, that's what I'm trying to be. Who dr who goes for those scientists who are actually doing the research, the Roy Taylors of this world, right. and um, uh, and then communicating in a way that reaches a broader audience in a simpler fashion, where they can understand it. Yeah, I think 
you know, those dietary patterns that you just mentioned before, the mind, the dash, whether it's a vegetarian or a vegan diet, that theme of eating, which is generally high fiber, there's a bias to unsaturated fats, uh, minimizing ultra processed foods. That is relatively uncontroversial when you're looking in the the true academic world. Yeah. <laughs> Most people agree on all of that. Yeah. It can like seem differently Gardner. on social media. But I think a lot of that is a lot of that comes down to the anecdote and the fact that in the short term, you can probably well you can improve your health on a number of different diets. Mm-hmm. But it's not always reflective of of how healthy you're going to be in the decades to come. Well, and that is an important point, the decades to come. I'm really focused on that because, well, I'm in those older decades. And uh, number one, and number two, that's one of the reasons I I don't think you can just throw out epidemiology. It just seems insane because those are the long-term studies, you know, that, that we depend on. So a lot of these diets like the carnivore diet, you know, it's the ultimate elimination diet. You just bring it down to monoculture food. Um, and maybe it does help you get over eczema or whatever. Um, you might, it, when you're eating a whole variety of plant foods, your chances of having some intolerance is higher, you know, to wheat or something. I don't know. And, um, but what does it do for you for the long term? To me, the picture is not looking good. So, and I know, you know, men especially. So from all the industries I've been in, I know that marketers love and the beef industry are some of the best marketers in the world and so is the dairy industry they know what makes people tick and with men it's masculinity and with women it's beauty and so like in the photography business we have all these professional photographers in the companies that we own um, and some of the best wedding photographers in the world (laughs) These themes go across all the industries. So if you're going to be a good wedding photographer and you want to sell wedding photos, you better make the men look masculine. And the masculine pose is to lean forward with elbows on your knees to broaden your shoulders to the camera and look masculine. A woman's pose is entirely different. She should Probably stand- Probably like what I'm doing right now. <laughs> well, no, she stands tall and you want to see curves. So she has, she puts, one leg in front of the other to slenderize, make her look more narrow and more curvy, you know, because it goes from narrow to wider at the hip. And uh, hands on the hips with the elbows out so you can see the shape of her body. And it's accentuated because the elbows give you the perception her body's got more curves. And she has to turn and look this way and so on. It's the feminine pose. And you better be doing that because that's what sells wedding fo- photographs. The car industry knows this. Men love, at least in America, they love trucks that are black with that are raised and have throaty exhausts and knobby tires and all that's what that's what beef is. They're selling it on masculinity. That's what Paul Saladino is doing, I think. So yeah, that takes us back to cellular agriculture and these other products and the importance of them. Yeah, because that's from a cultural point of view. I think that's going to be hard to change. Yeah, well, it's been with us for as long as. We've been hunter gatherers, right? I mean, we've always honored the hunters for probably what millions of years. What's next for plant chompers? What are you planning on getting your chompers stuck into? <laughs> well, so that that's a very interesting question. Uh, you know, I break all the rules of of being successful on YouTube because I I don't submit episodes as fast as the YouTube algorithm wants to see. You know, if I ever get one out two weeks after the last one, that's fast. Um, usually it's three weeks or four weeks. Um, and it's just me. I don't have any, I do everything. Uh, and my channel gets really popular when I release an episode. And then it just dies if it has to wait four weeks for me to come out with the, the next episode. But I, the episodes I like doing are like John Oliver's last week tonight. Um, where he does a deep dive on some subject that really matters to people that's emotional and so on. I really like doing that. And I like it to be funny and positive and everything else. So like right now I'm working on this episode about um, the Japanese school program, which I just think is the envy of the world and brilliant. But I, I keep getting asked to do like 
address this issue with, you know, triglyceride to HDL ratio that Ben Bickman promotes and, and Paul Mason pr promotes. And I don't really like doing those episodes. I know Gil doesn't like doing them either. Um, but they're, they get a lot of views and people really want to see that because they're confused. And in that way, I look at myself. <clears throat> so in all the years I was in the computer industry, the best journalist was Walt Mossberg, um, who wrote for the Wall Street Journal. He used to be a political reporter. And he decided he wanted to move into uh, electronics. And no one could believe it. You don't know anything about electronics. That's crazy. And he said, well, I think that's what will make it work, is instead of a geek who admires these companies who's writing in geeky language, I'm going to write as a consumer who's got the same problem as everybody else does. And that's the way I see these episodes like on Paul Mason or, or Ben Bickman or something. There's an expert over there who's very confident in saying one thing. And there's an expert over there who's very confident saying exactly the opposite. And they have a PhD or an MD and you don't. So what are you going to do as a consumer? Where's the Walt Mossberg who can say, hmm, do I buy the iPhone or do I buy the Android? Well, that might depend on your likes and loves and everything else. And so I am that person. I have a strong science background, but not, you know, a super strong nutritional science background and never will have. But I am in your position. I feel your pain because I hear what Paul Mason says. And then people come to me and say, I'm not taking a statin and because LDL is a hoax. Um, and then they go to someone else, their cardiologist, and the cardiologist says, please don't believe that stuff from Paul Mason. I've been doing this for 30 years. Hopefully they come across Thomas Dayspring. Yeah, Thomas Dayspring, uh, Dr. Lipid. Um, and uh, so I just sometimes have to hold my nose <laughs> and do these episodes. I've seen you comment on Twitter. It's a great service to the industry and so on. And, and, but I'd rather do the funny, positive ones and, and occasionally give myself a dose of reality with some of these misinformation ones. Well, I think you, I mean, I said at the beginning, when I first opened that link on that email that you sent me, yeah. I, I knew that, that, you know, you, you are cut from a different cloth and you do have an incredible ability to tell a story and and keep it humorous um some of these topics can be a little dry and boring so i think you're doing a fantastic job there and well, it's a kind of mutual admiration because that's why i reached out to you because i feel the same about you i've listened to your episodes from the very first one on entrepreneurship selling coconuts <laughs> you know <laughs> and, and uh uh you and gil and i just think yeah but i'm old and these guys are the future you know they've got decades ahead of them. And if I can, you know, help lift them up any way possible, I'm going to do it. Yeah. I think that's the other thing with researching this episode and seeing everything that you've done. And we, we haven't even explored it all. We barely touched on the entrepreneurial stuff that you've done and um, your athletic endeavors. We oh, can yeah. perhaps save room for, for another episode. Massacring my fair freckled skin by doing Iron Man's hmm. and I've paid for it with some skin cancers. Hmm. So... But just seeing all of the different chapters is inspiring for someone like me to know that you can you can do so much and you're still going so strong now. So um, I appreciate everything that you do. Well, I feel like I'm getting my footing now. I'm starting to understand. You know, I didn't know when I came into this. It's sort of like going to work for Steve Jobs or General Magic or whatever I've done. When I make a career switch like that, it's like it takes me a couple of years to really get the lay of the land, two or three years. And I feel like, hey, I've been doing this for, I don't know, two and a half years or something, at least part time, because I was also doing videos for like, <laughs> I have to tell you, I was very tempted to ride down here on a motorcycle because the world had uh, the American headquarters of Ducati is right by my house and they have some sweet new rides. <laughs> and I could have come down the coast highway filming with my drone and everything else and posted on my adventure rider site. We didn't get into that. And I would have got hundreds of thousands of views and had a great time. But I flew down because I'm devoted to nu nutrition and I do love this too. And um, But I feel like I'm getting my footing on this now. So the episodes are are getting better and um, and they're getting a lot more views and subscribers. And thanks to you, you're getting the word ar out around it. I don't promote it well. No, please, please keep going. There's many, many people that want to see you achieve great success. I mean, you already have, but I, I feel like 
it is just the beginning of what you're doing with plant oh, chompers and it's really important work thinking about your uh personal journey and general magic i asked you that question about failure yeah <laughs> um there's that quote failure isn't the end failure is just the beginning yeah and that kind of rings true for both general magic but also your story and being kicked out of class early in life and then being able to kind of pull everything together go to stanford and have this incredible career it must it must feel crazy to look back on it it does i can't believe it but i've had a lot of failure but our friend jeff bezos uh used to say you learn more from failure than you do from success and some of the, I mean, he's just thinking, he would, he tried cell phones. He tried auctions to compete with eBay. He's had spectacular failures, but they learned a lot from it. So. Thanks, Chris. Really, yeah, really appreciated this. Uh, we'll make sure that we put a lot of links into the show notes and pop a few things up on screen to support the episode and send everyone over yeah, to great. the uh, Plant Chompers channel. Yeah, great. Thank you. Okay. Keep chomping. Thank you very much. <laughs> you too. There you have it, friends. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did and want to stay up to date with future episodes, be sure to hit that subscribe button on YouTube and follow on Apple or Spotify. Finally, thank you for showing up and the effort that you're making to take control of your health. I look forward to hanging out with you again in the next episode.